Keith waits to give Owen Farrell the go-ahead. England are playing from right to left. South Africa awaiting the kickoff. And the noise is building. On the tunnel, they implore the crowd to make some noise. They don't need any encouragement. England fans have flocked across the channel in the last 24 hours. A lot of South Africans may have booked tickets for the semi-final in both hope and expectation. A place next Saturday night in the global showpiece, the World Cup final awaits the winner against the mighty All Blacks. As referee Ben O'Keefe says, let's go to work. And Owen Farrell chips, quite a short kick. And Joe Marchand came forward and almost claimed it, but he knocked it on and it will be South Africa ball 25 metres out. As the rain teams down, we'll go to Paul Grayson on the touchline any moment now. Let's see what South Africa do, though. 25 odd metres from their own line. This is five live sport from the BBC. On your radio, on your mobile, online, and on your BBC Sounds app. As Freddie Stewart, that's why he's in the team, to take those high balls from Reinach's kick. And you might be able to hear a Leila Bleu go around the Stade de France. A lot of those devastated French fans have still come tonight to offer their neutral support but are they back in the team that knocked them out or oh, the old enemy in England lesser of two evils maybe for the French as Alex Mitchell sends it high and that's good from England they win the contestable and because it was open play for Newland was an offside but England do have it bang in centre field Peter steps over that ball looking for the turnover he's not got it penalty England referee Ben O'Keefe had a long look he said they weren't legal South Africa what a chance for England and Owen Farrell wow well, I mean, we, there's not a lot to talk about when it comes to the actual rugby. It's a bit of a kick fest, but it's who's going to make the mistake. I would say that was a close call. Steph de Toy there was all over it, poaching and jackling for the ball. Ben O'Keefe. Ben O'Keefe wasn't quite happy with the way that he was jackling it. I think actually if you, if you look at it, it looked like he wasn't supporting his own body weight. So he was there, he was quickest on it, but he'd, he'd actually been bumped out of the way and he was holding, or just he had one hand sort of supporting himself, which you can't do, you've got to have both hands on the ball. I was going to throw to Paul Grayson on the touchline, but he is so close to the action. He's down there with his umbrella because it is now teeming down at the Stade de France. We're okay from up here, we're not going to distract Owen Farrell, but you feel Grace is so close that if we throw to him, he might uh, he might be heard by the England captain, who's lining up a kick bang in front. We're just two minutes gone as the shot clock ticks down. Remember what happened against Samoa? Farrell, up he steps, nice clean strike, straight through, Owen Farrell on the money. 1,206 England points becomes 12.09. So let's go down to Paul Grayson, your magnificent view, right on the touchline, Grace, those first few minutes. Yeah, amazing to be down here this close, seven or eight metres from the touchline. Felt like you were absolutely in the anthem as it started. England switched the kick-up off, went short, and when they went to the air and won that contestable, Elliot Daly sprinted out to the left wing, started waving his hands uh, for a high ball to be put up straight away before the penalty was given. So look out for England using their wingers uh, with quick kicks when they get turnovers. Kick-off from South Africa and Libok, their fly-half. You do wonder if... Razi Erasmus and Jacques Nienaber knew the weather would be like it was, whether they would have gone for the experience of Andre Pollard, that goal-kicking accuracy. But they have had faith in Libok throughout this tournament as Alex Mitchell sends up another kick. His kicks have been on the money. Daly has gone up and South Africa lose that. So England, so far, are edging those, those contestable kicks. And that uh, is such a key part of the game, particularly on a day like today. Who wins those But Where does the ball bounce? I noticed that. An early box kick from Reinhardt. Uh, the, the shielding from England on the retreat to give Freddie Stewart a lovely opportunity to, to catch it clean and set it up was so well rehearsed. You know they've been doing it ad nauseum in, on the training park. Great, opposition, uh, great opportunity here for South Africa. England three, South Africa nil after four minutes. La Marcia has now the French fans are beaten but not unbowed in the stands tonight but loads of England and South Africans in here too as Joe Marler trucks up after England won the line out on South Africa's ball so really positive signs Owen Farrell's gone with a, a high kind of spiral bomb that is filthy no one's catching that innovative tactics Paul Grayson Farrell going for the, the spiral bomb we expected them to come up with things different in the kicking game Green options from the line 
towards the touchline, which which mitigates the risk somewhat. Because if you can land the ball inside 10 metres in from touch, if South Africa win it, you can hard press in the middle and put the squeeze on them. If you go up the middle, you leave both sides vulnerable. Good early shot from Owen Farrell. Yeah, the warm up. Uh, England were practicing, well, uh, Owen Farrell particularly practicing all sorts of high balls down the field, cross field, long cross field wipers, but also loads of little grubber kicks, Chris. Lots of opportunities to turn. Even Alex Mitchell breaking off the rucks, breaking off the scrums, nudging it through to say to South Africa, What have you got? What have you got from 80, 90 meters? What can you do? Big moment here. The first scrum of this Rugby World Cup semi final. It is to South Africa. They didn't take Farrell's kick cleanly, but referee Ben O'Keefe has judged it came forward off England. The first scrum. But you need to listen. I'm loud. Wait for the call. That's both teams. The first team that goes early is a free kick. And he's laying down the laws to the front row, saying, don't go early. How much nervous tension, Bobby, you've not been in the front row, been in a lot of those scrums, I reckon it's just everyone twitching to get involved. Oh, absolutely, and so much riding on it as well, because you've got to start well, you know, in, in, in these scrums, you want to know whether you've got ascendancy, you know, you've, you've got your opposition for the next 60, 70 minutes right in front of you, can you do something good? Can you make sure you, within the rules that you get ascendancy over your opposition? And Joe Marler and Dan Cole, the veteran props, in their last World Cups, have been picked to provide that kind of scrum solidity England is showing. Good picture from England that scrum, even though it's South Africa who peel away with the ball on their own feed through Dwayne Vermeulen. Back from Reinach to Libok, who sends it high. Test of a Freddie Stewart. Real test, a great take, Freddie Stewart. Just short of the halfway line, but the young man, just 22, doing what he does best, tidying up balls in the backfield. England on their own 10-metre line. George Martin with an industrious little carry just short of the halfway line. 3-0 to England, who have started this World Cup semi-final with a lot of composure and a lot of accuracy so far. Alex Mitchell implored to use it by referee O'Keefe, sends up another box kick, and again, Matt, this looks nicely weighted from Mitchell. As South Africa don't take it cleanly, Courtney Laws is on the ball. And England again have won the kick contest. And Mitchell kicks a really nice little end over end of Matt, but no one rushing after it because Daly was on the floor after the, uh, the attempt to catch. Well, well these, these conditions, that's a great kick, doesn't matter. It just puts the pressure, imagine the pressure just lifting significantly um, on the South African line now because they lost their last one. It's going to be a little bit twitchy. Have England got their mark? Have they worked out where Etzebeth and Mozart are going? Benambi to throw. South Africa only, what, 12 metres from their own line. Can England put pressure on? Oh, nicely done. Peter Steff at the tail. Not straight. Not straight from South Africa. And Paul Grayson right in front of you. England now have a set-piece opportunity 10 metres out from the block line. Dream start for England, isn't it? That flick over the top from Alex Mitchell landing six inches in from the touchline right down here. And then the line out there, they worked it well, South Africa, okay. to create yeah, the space. The Peter the Steph Dutoy goes up uncontested. Yeah, Poor skill execution play. from Mbanambi. And it's all happening right in front of you, Grace. The rubber, the green yeah. gone South Africa's time way. Carry just getting a little bit of attention to, I think, the side of his face. And time off called by Ben O'Keefe. Both teams will be pleased about it. None more so than South Africa. They look a bit shell shocked. England absolutely on the rampage. And England, Matt Dawson, doing exactly what we spoke about all week on the pod. Kicking accurately, getting up in the air and just trying to ask questions with the boot of the box. It's, uh, it, does, it does throw me back a little bit. this 20 years when we played France in that semi-final. Woke up in the morning. It was hammering it down. And just this beaming grin on every... You imagine Martin Johnson and Loris Delalio and Neil back. Phil Vickery just licking their lips at the thought of going into a kick and scrum fest. Um, now, England have got more than that these days. Of course they have. But you just feel with a selection, Johnny May, Elliot Daly getting up high. Freddie Stewart winning his kicks at the moment. Arance and, and Colby, and they're not looking great under those high balls. Well, you spoke, Matt, before the game with Sonia about England taking opportunities. Okay. We've off. seen Easy it picture. in these World Cup keeper. knockouts already, especially last weekend. We've just got to go through the phases here, Chris. Yep. Up, it's a very dangerous tactic for England. Unless they really think they've got them, it's very, very dangerous to mess around in this area with the ball at the base because you feel 
Ben O'Keefe is ready. He's poised to make a decision. And the way that Ben Earl can play, get the ball in play, go through the face. It's so difficult to defend multi-phases in these conditions, slippy and wet. And then you'd like to think at the minimum you're going to get a penalty for an offside or maybe a, a ruck infringement. Well, Dan Cole, you heard chatting to Ben O'Keefe. They're using all of those miles on the clock. Good English scrum and Ben Earl at number eight peels away. He's been one of England's standout players and he drives to within six. Mitchell has Courtney Laws round the corner. Ever so slightly isolated. Great, clear Maro Itoje. England seven metres out. They lead by three with nine minutes to go. And they're only six metres out as Khaleesi comes in. Advantage England. Again, South Africa give the penalty away. Referee Ben O'Keefe said the ruck was formed. Boos from some of the South Africans in the crowd. But England will throw this over from five metres out. Talk us through your view of that, Paul Grayson. A very quick heel from the scrum as England went to within five metres. Dawes called it perfectly. Uh, ben Earl rocketed off the back of that scrum. Won the collision, gets him on the front foot. Courtney Laws. He's it's never going to clear that line. breakdown. It's He's going to be the next runner around the corner. Mitchell, no hesitation to hit him. England winning the collisions at the moment, which is why South Africa are going to have to are taking some chances in the rook. Perfect start for, for me, England. The ruck becomes unplayable. You can't go for the ball. The contest was won. Yeah, Ben O'Keefe said the ruck contest was won, but obviously there, Bobby Sia Khaleesi thought the ruck was over. He had a double. Risky under your own post. You get away with them sometimes. He didn't that time. Farrell won't miss. No, he certainly won't, won't, not from that close. I think Khaleesi's got a really good idea of when you can and can't contest the ball on the ground. He went for it, he didn't get given it, you know, that's what happens at this level. Not to be too negative though, South Africa, or not to try and take too much positive out of a negative, but South Africa will be happier giving away three points than seven. It is just three points, as you say, Bobby. Bobby Skinstad, former Springbok captain with us on Five Live Sport. But Matt Dawson, England, 10 minutes gone, they lead by six. Fantastic start, really solid start. England could not ask for anything more, not just the points, but where they've played the rugby, how they've played the rugby. Perfect uh, strategy given the conditions. The set piece looks solid. Why would England change what they're doing? Yep, they are bossing the territory and possession, England, who lead by six. But it is such early days against the world champions, the number one side in the world, and a team who we saw last Sunday night can beat anyone, anywhere. Take a step, take a step, Green! Alex Mitchell, who's kicked very nicely, Matt Dawson. That's another one. Clears up almost a halfway. Well, and also that's what, that's what says to the opposition, we're happy. We're happy with you having the line out. Go on then, send all your... We'll, we'll take a... Yeah, we'll make it a 50-50. Maybe we'll poach one. Maybe you'll get the ball. Yeah, South Africa are never going to fling it wide, wide, wide because of these conditions. So you can gamble a little bit when you've got as good a line out as England. Bongi and Banambi, the brilliant South African hooker, but a lot rests on his shoulders with no Malcolm Marks. He finds his man, the imposing figure of Eben Etzebeth, surely in the frame to be World Player of the Year. 118th cap for the 31-year-old, but England have got in there and made that more stationary for South Africa. So they go to the reliable figure of Damien Dierlandi in midfield. Reinhardt goes to the right, but he's isolated. He's caught by Curry. Martin was then in there, so not much doing here for the Springboks. Libok's got to go and play in at number nine. You heard Owen Farrell there urging England's defensive line. You may have picked him up on the ref, Mike. And South Africa have been kept within their own half by a pretty solid England defensive effort so far. Halfway line just short. South Africa going to kick through Reinhardt. In centre field, he sends that a little bit too long and Stewart will gobble this up. He does. Tackled by Khaleesi and Kurt Lee Aronser. Both quickly on to the England fullback, but England have resourced the ball just inside their 22. They lead by six on five live sport as Mitchell finds Marla. Winning his 88th cap, so much experience in both these outfits. 13 of this England 23 played in the World Cup final four years ago. Okay, for South Africa, it's 16 as they look to go back to back as Mitchell again clears. And after all that, South Africa throwing in a roundabout where they started uh, Bobby Skinstad. It'll be a South African line out, 10 metre line in the England half. I'm not sure why South Africa are not asking because I was carried back by England because uh, I think Stuart was caught or Daly was caught ball and all and smashed back into the 22 
we'll see you. Guys, just with the lineouts, we can't keep having the meetings before the lineout's set. If you want to do it, if the ball's not there, fine, but come in, show numbers clearly, please, and be two metres. Ben O'Keefe just talking yeah, to the South Africa forwards injury. there, saying that... Um, it's, a great, it's a great spot, Bobby. Yeah, Freddie Stewart's caught that outside and gone back in. You get the co what? What? Now, surely, coaches into water carriers, into the captain, get in Ben O'Keefe's ear right now. Carry back over. Yeah, that could well then have been a line out to South Africa inside England's 22. Instead, Mbanambi's going to throw in on the 10 metre line. And while we wait for the line out, Paul Grace on the touchline, talk us through the conditions still hammering down. Yeah, it's, it's, it's lightened a little bit, but but still very much raining. It's interesting yeah, to see on. here that there's uncertainty in what South Africa are doing at the moment. Yep, uh, Kobus Reinach running backwards and forwards, delivering calls to Bongi and Banambi uh, and to Manny Libak. He got lost in the last breakdown and tagged. So they're in, uh, I wouldn't say they're in disarray, but they're not running quite as hot as they were last, last week. World Cup winner, former England fly half, Paul Grayson on the touchline. That's much better from South Africa. They won the line out. They've got a rolling ball going. It went sideways, then it went forwards, then it's collapsed. Is the ball unplayable? England are trying to steal. I think England may have turned that ball over. Brilliant work from the England forwards just when South Africa were motoring. And Farrell kind of just delayed his kick and then hacked it downfield. Here's Willem, sir, in the backfield. Own 10 metre line for South Africa. He chips kind of for himself. Freddie Stewart takes it. Penalty to South Africa. England were in front of Owen Farrell when he kicked. They didn't retreat. And it's going to be a South African penalty, Bobby Skinstad. Boos from the crowd. And a chance for the box to go for Poles. And a tester for Libok if they do so. Amazing. You just saw um, Owen Farrell. He, he was going to kick and then he waited. And in, those, in that half a second, two players just went in front of him. You know, if, he, if he'd gone with the first kick, there was, there was two on one out in the wing there. South Africa deciding not to take the, the shot to goal. It's as if he... It's as if he should have gone with his instinct. That's, what, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And then he checked himself. Owen Farrell checked himself. Not going for the points. It's huge. Well, Lebok has kicked it to within about 10, maybe a metre or two more. South Africa attacking from left to right, but it's England who have spent much of the first quarter of an hour in Bok territory. Two Farrell penalties, England six, South Africa nil. 15 minutes gone, but the Bok's are pressing. Their most dangerous attacking position of the game so far, and they've won it through Eben Etzebeth. They roll to the side and then try and roll forward. England's more defence has been good so far, and again, they've repelled the box here, and referee Ben O'Keefe has given a scrum to England. And look at the reaction from the England fans, pockets of them all across the stand, wearing white. They know the significance that it flares up as well from the ensuing melee. Referee O'Keefe is staying cool and calm and talking to his assistant referees. Nothing really happening with that fracas, Matt Dawson, but you can tell from the reaction of the England players and the crowd, they know that if you stop the Springbok more, that's a big feather in the cap. Oh, what a moment that is. You just felt South Africa, it looked like they sort of had that blanket coverage in the mall, just set, ready to launch the foot speed, but somehow England sort of span it round and then managed to, someone got one of their big ugly paws on it from an England perspective and stopped. So can, I, can I talk? Guys, I'm going to make it very clear and simple. When I blow my whistle, I will not accept any players pushing and shoving after that, yeah, OK? Yeah. Yeah. Number 12, he's not any, even part of that, comes in and pushes unnecessarily green nine, OK? He grabs him around the neck. He will be penalised. If we get that any more in the game by either team, I'll escalate to more penalties or yellow cards. So is it a penalty for It is a penalty. Yeah. I want to see it. you talk to your team, so please, we'll to stop it. So, so them going back at us and causing the whole thing. Yep, Owen, that's, that's Owen, bad. Manu, you're 12 started. Go back and talk no, no, to them. I don't want any more. We can't retaliate. Hey? It'd be reverse retaliate to the other yeah. times. What's back? back. What? What? You did nothing, you just... See ya. Okay. I've asked you, you to talk to, you. You I've asked you to, to your team. Yeah. Owen, please. You keep telling yourself that. Well, Ben O'Keefe and both okay. captains, and then both captains having words with each other. The significant upshot is that England have given a penalty away. They did so well at the mall, brilliantly at the mall, to repel South Africa, win the scrum, but then Manu Tuolangi has been penalised for going in and starting a fracas. Let's pick this up in a moment as we get a quick update from our Premier League match this evening. Sheffield United against Manchester United at Bramall Lane and John Bennett.
It's nil nil, Chris. Scrappy game. Sheffield United should have the lead. Ollie McBurney wasting a very good early chance. The Manchester United fans repeatedly singing. There's only one Bobby Charlton. Sheffield United nil. Manchester United nil. Thank you very much, John. Yes, so many thoughts at Bramall Lane with the family of the great Sir Bobby Charlton, who sadly passed away earlier. And we'll be with John and Paul Robinson throughout the evening from Bramall Lane. A South Africa kick to the corner from that penalty given away by Manu Tuolangi. That was sloppy from England, losing their discipline and feeding the box with their main weapon at the mall. One of their main weapons, one of their many weapons. But again, it's gone to ground and England have done really well to not let the box go forward. And then South Africa knock on from what some great tackle. England defence. What a tackle that is. Wow. George Martin has smashed Mostar's there. Absolutely smashed him. I mean, we had a little bit of a chat earlier today, Bobby, about this fella, George Martin, being, you know, dogged, to so say physical. the least. Yeah, yeah, look at this. Shoo! Mind you, oh, saying that, saying that. We've got to use two arms. We've just had another angle. You'd hope that it would go upstairs. You'd think the TMO should really be saying something there. There was no arms out there. It was a tucked left shoulder as he's gone in. England actually a little bit lucky. Bobby Skinstad reflective. Martin making a, a powerful intervention, but just flirting with the lines of legality. England scrum, and it's going to be a penalty to England as South Africa go to their knee. And I tell you what, that's a big moment. Two rolling malls repelled by England, and then they win a scrum penalty four years on from South Africa, demolishing England's pack in Yokohama. This time, England win the penalty and a chance, priceless chance, for Owen Farrell to clear the lines. Listen, we're a long way away here, Bobby, but I am not, I mean, Benke, there is not a chance anyone can talk about him being on South Africa's side this, this time round. There's been two or three calls where they have been, let's say, marginal and it's gone to England. <laughs> we'll take it all day, but, you know, that becomes a little bit frustrating for South Africa. England with the line out, still in a threatening position because South Africa are only 30 odd metres from their own line. That's a lovely throw in these conditions from Jamie George to Courtney Laws at the tail. And you do feel England have got their tactics down to a tee. They're taking their time, they're playing it at their pace, and all of the kicks from Alex Mitchell have been so accurate. That's another one. It's a perfect box kick. And I tell you what, Aarons has done absolutely fantastically to take that. That's well done from the diminutive right winger for South Africa. Peter Steff drives, well tackled by England, but they've just got to make sure they're tackling with both arms wrapped. The last thing England need is to give away a card through ill discipline. They've already had a penalty against them needlessly when Tuolangi came in. The crossfield is claimed by England, doing exactly what France weren't able to do six days ago, where they coughed up ball and South Africa scored straight from it. And again, Alex Mitchell prepares to kick, and as a former nine, Matt Dawson, you must be loving the control he's showing so far. Well, and, and I'm pretty sure Alex Mitchell, and it's a far side, we're a good 150 metres away here, but I'm fairly sure it was Alex Mitchell who went up to, to get the ball. Uh, he is having a blinder at the moment, but again, England are working out where South Africa want to play, where they want to kick, and they're sending the right amount of people into those areas. Very, very clever defensively at the moment, England. Reinach back to Libok, who goes with a kind of half crossfield, half clearance kick. That's a horrible one for anyone to take. I think Daly has taken that, and that was a miraculous catch. Over his shoulder, but he's then given a penalty away, or England forwards arriving have gone off their feet. Yeah, Jamie George singled out for losing his feet, and it will be a penalty to South Africa, Bobby Skinstad. And it's a 10-metre concession from England. And Owen Farrell is really in the ear of referee Ben O'Keefe, who's marched England back 10 metres for not giving the ball away. And again, the box, Bobby, will have a chance to kick for goal. Or do they go to the mall, which so far hasn't been able to drive England over? England have had their number in the mall so far. Be interested to see what they do. There's a couple of players gathering around Marnie Lubbock, who looks like he's indicating to go for the three-pointer. Jonesy just down here, Richard Hill, team manager, former England back row, absolute legend of a player. 
and a bloke quite active. He's just run off behind the post where the England subs are uh, um, are doing a little bit of a warm up. He's having a chat with Kyle Sinclair. Ellis Genge has wandered back to where the subs are, but Richard Hill has gone over to be in Kyle Sinclair's ear. Sinclair's taken off his uh, subs coat and uh, removing his bib, so changes of foot, I think. Well, Dan Cole doesn't look injured from here. He's standing with his hands on his um, on his waist, looking towards the post where Libok is kicking towards. I mean, England wouldn't sort of tactically replace someone after 20, would they? But we'll keep a, a close eye on that. England... We'll be trying things tonight, there is no doubt about that. Libok then to put the box on the board. 20 compelling minutes gone in Paris. England 6, South Africa nil. Five live sport from the BBC. Live in the stad. Libok steps up. Lovely strike. That has split the post in half. Bobby, a real settler that one for the fly half, whose goal kicking has come under a bit of scrutiny through this tournament. Yeah, he's incredibly accurate with both feet in terms of his directional kicking around the field, but he's battled off the tee, and we, we know that, and, and it's been the conjecture from everybody, does he ever? Owen Farrell to thank, though, because he couldn't make that kick from the halfway line, but he could from the 10-yard line. Yeah, uh, Farrell has to sort his discipline out there. has been a couple of occasions, one on his own line and one occasion there where it's just unnecessarily in referee O'Keefe's ear. Get away from it, leave it alone, at Owen. And in that case, you saw Joe, uh, Joe Marchant pushing Owen Farrell away to say, leave it, mate, leave it, it's fine. Well, England have started really well. But they've got to get that balance right between being as up for it as they are, but also just keeping their cool and not losing their discipline. Johnny May, not seen much of him yet, perhaps understandable in these wet Paris conditions, he takes it well, Mitchell back to Farrell, Farrell's kick asking a posse of Englishmen to chase, Damien Willemse takes it without having to jump and then he flips it out to Aaron Sir, just short of his own 22, he lamps it down the channel to Freddie Stewart, Stewart infield to Owen Farrell, tactical game of chess unfolding in front of us in Saint-Denis north of Paris as Willemse takes it and it's clattered by opposite number Stewart and then Courtney Laws has done brilliantly to get onto that and listen to the England fans, because England have the ball, perhaps with the numbers to the left. Stewart at first receiver, nice hands, Mitchell. Great pick up Earl, Earl into the 22. Great footwork from the Saracen. What an opportunity for England, who lead by three. They've got another penalty. Look at the fans in front of us. They're cheering. They know three points might be coming, but do England have something else? Farrell will kick for Daly. Is that one for Elliot Daly? Not quite, just overcooked. Back for the penalty as South Africa fold over the ruck and Paul Grayson. All the fans around you on the touchline know the importance of every three points. Absolutely, and that, that South Africa's willingness to shift the point of contact after the high ball. If they get a clean catch, first time it was uh, Villemse to uh, Arenza on the right wing. Second time he threw it in field to Libak, who really wasn't, he didn't look all that keen to get it. Awesome work on the floor from a chasing Courtney Laws, first man to win the breakdown. And then after two phases, we saw then the switch of direction by Farrell at the end and the little dink over the top in the corner for Daly. They are looking for that all the time. I've been amazed at the disorganisation of South Africa in the backfield. They Surely, Bobby, they would know that this is coming. England have, have, have kicked the leather off the ball for the last couple of years. And accurately, though, tonight. Very, very yeah. accurately. It's outside the 22. It's catching man and ball at the same time. I mean, the chases have been very good. You have to have to doff your cap at that. I think South Africa is certainly trying to absorb the pressure, but as the scoreboard ticks over for England, they'll, they'll be thinking that they're losing that battle. Little discipline laps to the side. It's been a tactical masterclass so far from England, who lead by three. England six, South Africa three, 24 minutes gone. The shot clock is counting down. Far Farrell needs to get on with this. Up steps the England skipper to make it 9-3. That snuck in nicely. England lead by six in the stand. England nine, world champion South Africa three. Yeah, very composed from England. Brilliant riposte there from South Africa's penalty. And all of a sudden, within two minutes, you get that six-point gap. And oh, could, we can all talk about it the whole way through this 80 minutes. Three points is worth six. Six is worth 12 tonight in these conditions, no doubt. And they go long through the restart South Africa. And Courtney Laws, oh, what a servant he's been, 105th cap. You never know with some of these England players towards the end of their careers, this could be their last time in the white of England. 
Because Not if they get to World Cup final, but the bronze medal match, if they don't win tonight, will see mass rotation, you'd expect. The last dance has been a running theme of this England campaign. One man who's got a lot of England caps to come is Alex Mitchell. That's an excellent kick. Halfway line, South Africa line. Now let's go back to Bramall Lane and John Bennett. And it's Sheffield United nil, Manchester United one. He's turning into a goal machine. It's Scott McTominay. Really good finish in the box. It bounced up. He volleyed it past the goalkeeper. It's against the run of play. They've been second best in this game. Sheffield United nil, Manchester United one. Nice one, John. Back with you as the action unfolds at Bramwell Lane. Pongi Panambi, that's a great throw. And they pop it down to Ransa, who's thrown a dummy and come through the line out. Innovation. A hallmark of the spring box, but oh, what a turnover. Who's got that? Might well have been Courtney Laws. Unbelievable work on the floor from England to snuff out that semi-line break from South Africa and again retrieve the ball. And Mitchell's kicking, I'm saying it a lot, his kicking's just been perfect so far. And Daly melts for Newland. Little man on big man. Brilliant stuff from the England left winger and the fans know it. The England support cheering every little win as Atoje's over that ball looking to steal. Oh, he's giving it South Africa's way. Yeah, not England not rolling away. Marla, Marla needs to get out of the way faster. He's got to recognise that South Africa are isolated and Marrow's going in. Marrow had the penalty. Yeah, all day. All day long. And then Joe Marla had just rolled over the, the, the ruck area. I think that was similar to the Peter Steph one earlier. He was painting a good picture, but another man singled out. Hacked to touch by Libok, who kicks left and right footed, doesn't he? I mean, that's uh, a pretty unique skill. And South Africa will have the line out, Matt Dawson, just short of the 22 in England territory. Owen Farrell still in the referee's ear there. Just, you know, we, we, need Owen, we need Owen Farrell cool and calm, head in the fridge, body on fire. South Africa have dominated territory over the last 10. No, sorry, not sorry. They've again not gone straight. So a couple of times, Paul Grayson on the touchline, you've seen up close South Africa getting their line-out drills wrong, which we seldom say. Yeah, and Benambi again being asked to throw to the back. They had a clean lift, plenty of space to throw it into. Just coming off the ball early, throwing it down the left-hand side as he's looking the South Africa side of the line-out. But it, the, from South Africa's point of view, riding out this early storm from England, England just about perfect so far. South Africa can keep it at six points, even though Dawson just highlighted how much that is. You feel England's ascendancy and dominance in this opening, what, 27 minutes. Uh, South Africa could, could try to get the ball back, get another three points. They'll be happy with that because it's been all England, really, in terms of the quality. Stoppage for Tom Curry, who again is having his forehead taped. And you heard Ben O'Keefe say to the England physio, that's three times. So it might be that Curry needs to go off for some more permanent treatment. But for now, it's just the patch up job with the forehead tape. I think we were, I think we've communicated this on one of the many fine podcasts you've done, Chris. Is that the top teams, when they win World Cups, Pretty much all of them on their journey will have a dodgy half. Right, they will. The history will tell you that. And you, England have to make the most of what's going on at the moment with South Africa because they're all over the show. For their standards, they're all over the show. You can't expect South Africa to come out in the second half and be as bad as this. England have to capitalise in some way, shape or form. Yeah, not with that leadership they've got, not with the brains trust in the coaching box. South Africa will have words at half-time, no doubt, because it's been England's half, or half an hour, I should say, as Ben Earl peels away, and England through Mitchell. He's not really in a kicking position, so he passes to Marlowe. He's done a pretty handy job this half of just putting his head down, setting it up and giving Mitchell a better platform from which to kick. England 9, South Africa 3 at the Stade de France. Three Owen Farron penalties against one from Manny Lipok as Mitchell was almost caught by Etzebeth, who's so good at seeing when the ball's out. The ball goes up from Mitchell and it's going to be a penalty actually to England. He has penalised Etzebeth, Bobby Skinstad. He normally is right on it, isn't he, Etz the Beth? And seeing when the ball's out. Not have the ball out offside. But you heard Ben O'Keefe there saying it was not out. Penalty England, chance to go back into Springbok territory as we go back to Bramwell Lane. You've got a penalty, John. 
Yes, it's a penalty to Sheffield United. It's Sheffield United nil, Manchester United won, but Oli McBurney has a chance now to equalise. Scott McTominay had scored for Manchester United a couple of minutes later. It was his handball which led to this penalty, a long VAR check. And now Oli McBurney has taken a couple of strides back, prepares to take this spot kick. Steps up Oli McBurney and he scores. Brilliant spot kick. Sheffield United won, Manchester United won. Thank you very much, John, at Bramall Lane as the goals go in in our late Premier League game. And England, from that penalty, Etzebeth caught offside, have cleared right in front of us. We are down the barrel of this one as Jamie George throws and he's picked off by the aforementioned Eben Etzebeth. So both forward packs are getting stuck into the other set piece and it's the box in their green who come away with the ball back to... Libok who kicks off his left, that's not gone too far, Johnny May, he may have tapped that back, Freddie Stewart steams onto it, and Freddie Stewart beats a couple of box, and goes to within 25 metres, 15 metres in from the right touchline, Marler again a first receiver, throws a dummy to George and sets it up, good quick ball for England, back to Farrell, Farrell kicks, it's been charged down and goes back in the hands of Mbanambi, so England had a lovely territorial position there, they weren't quite able to execute what they were trying, which was a Bit of a switch kick from Owen Farrell and South Africa win the penalty as England infringe and then Libok drops it. So it will be a penalty to the box. Offside. Offside in between their own 22 and 10 metre line, Bobby, and a chance for South Africa to go back into English territory. Yeah, they want to get out of their half. Yeah, George Martin has made about five or six bone shatteringly uh, heavy tackles. Huge, I mean, it's it? absolutely Huge. brilliant, the physicality. Uh, Joe Marler giving a penalty away, very similar to. Khaleesi in uh, in the first sort of five or ten minutes when Khaleesi went for that ruck thinking the ruck was over thinking like he could steal it it's very obvious the referee's not having it the referee is calling ruck don't go in and win it these Team are the South little Africa. moments where oh hello here we go Chris well Libok's Dorse, coming I was a, off sorry go I was on, about Grace. to jump in I was about to jump in there and say Libok looks miles off it He's kick, he kicks with both feet brilliantly normally He's not hit one decent one tonight off either foot. He looks like he's not, not I'm not going to say rabbit in the headlights, but not comfortable out there. They made an early change. But they won't mind Paul Grayson, Andre Pollard, World Cup winning fly half in these conditions, will they? No, absolutely not. Perfectly set for him. I feel sorry for Libic. It hasn't gone his way. Maybe he's got a little groin strain or, or something, but uh, Pollard's a perfect man for this situation. Big moment in the World Cup semi-final as South Africa changed their fly half. England lead 9-3. to three. They've bossed a lot of this first half, just have nine points to show for it, even though South Africa have worked their way back into the game. But then Reinach just kicks it away, Matt Dawson. Freddie Stewart, he just gobbles that up. And does that look like a South Africa side that are a little bit, maybe, what? dare I say, rattled out there? Bobby, they've got no pattern, have they, South no, Africa? Absolutely, very jumpy. Lots of mistakes from South Africa. Great pressure from England. It's just turning out to be one of those great semi-finals where you see the the teams and how much it means affecting two different teams differently. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, from a driving mall that South Africa, you, because South Africa have lost two or three of those driving malls, they're then edgy at the base. So all of us... Is there a blood, blood injury here? Is it Tom Curry? Yeah, I remember we mentioned that his, his yep. face had been opened up a couple of times and yeah he needs to get that nose sorted that looks actually not like a bit of blood that might be a broken nose potentially for Tom Curry so I mean on those driving malls from South Africa that yeah they might well be getting a little bit of a trundle on but England are being awkward and because they've sacked a couple of them Okay, he's they've on the just put the field. edge on onto he's South Africa say oh what are you going to do and on that occasion Ryan out is looking for his fly half to say well what are we doing next because I don't want to drive it because we might lose it so and then he's sort of tried to have a little dart himself and then nothing's on then he's kicking it's rippling through the South African side from an England perspective you'd be shouting and screaming at your own team we have got these boys be patient stick in no penalties keep the discipline Halfway line, and Banambi to throw for South Africa. England nine, South Africa three. Seven and a half minutes left of this first half. It's not been fluent running rugby like we saw in Paris last weekend, but tight, tense and captivating. And England lead by six. They said they were going to come here with a tactical plan. So far, they've been true to their word. Reinert kicks, and that's too long. 
Daly will take this over his shoulder, but he drops it, not under a huge amount of pressure. It might be back on England's side, a South Africa look to counter Ruck, so it is back in English possession, but a hairy moment for Elliot Daly. Mitchell out to Billy Vanapola, who's lost it, the replacement, on for Curry. And South Africa have it 10 metres out. This is the box best opportunity of the semi final as Kits off the loose head peels around the corner to within seven or eight. A South African try and conversion would take them clear as England infringe. Ben O'Keefe's penalty advantage to the world champions. Mbanambi carries big collision with George Martin, who's putting himself about physically. But these are physical men, the South Africans. No one does the tight game better than the men in green. They lead by, uh, they trail by six, but Pollard now has it and throws a dummy and has a dart. England nine, South Africa three with six to go till the break, but a concerted bit of pressure from the box as Diolande pops it up to Franco Muster. Seven metres out, to the right of the post, loose ball from Diolande to Pollard, to Alangi's onto it, England fans cheer, no advantage, offside England, and a chance for Pollard, Bobby Skinstad, sure to take this to a three-point game. I've got penalty for... Yeah, un unbelievable outside. little set of play. There's just a couple of mistakes. I see Mostert looking really uncomfortable. <laughs> he's, look, he's lost his boot. That's why he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to get involved in the game anymore. But you're 100 percent right. I mean, you, you know, Dawes, you mentioned it. The nerves were showing differently. That's the first time I've seen England, and it is slippery. So, so you know, Freddie Schultz had some great takes already. That was a little mistake which allowed South Africa to get into the 22 and turn that ball over. Well, we talked talk about opportunities, not only with the ball in attack, but with the ball in defence. You will not get many opportunities. You, sorry, you won't get away with any mistakes when you're in your own 22. And on that occasion, Elliot Daly fumbles it. Billy Vunapola fresh off the bench. All you do is just truck it up and get through it, coughs it up. 15 metres from his own line and the pressure. I mean, goodness knows how many tackles Billy Vinopola made in that last passage of play because he knew his reputation was on the line having dropped that. Paul Grayson on the touchline, your view as Andre Pollard prepares to put this over from bang in front. Just a completely le different level of physicality from England tonight. Yes, they've not necessarily needed it so far in the World Cup, but they've, they've been absolutely superb in those contact areas. As Pollard just clips it over to draw the scores to three. They've been they've been monster in South Africa down here at ground level. You hear that crack of the of the impacts and then quick glance up to the big screen. You almost get half a second delay so you can you can see it again. Amazing hitting from England. England still lead by three, but South Africa have just worked their way back into the semi-final. And after spending Matt Dawson much of the first half with our, our heads craned to the left, there's been a bit more action going on to our right now. Yeah, again, in these conditions, territory. That pinpoint kicking game has to be nailed on for both sides that they want to have a sniff. You just don't want the ball in your own half today. Continues to pour down at the Stade de France. Yeah, territory, mistakes, fitness, discipline. All of those factors are going to be key. And both coaching boxes will look to their bench, you feel, sooner rather than later. England's veteran props, how much longer have they got out there? As South Africa clear almost up to halfway, we're ticking towards half time. Four minutes to go till the break. England nine, South Africa six. But England have a line out just inside the box half and a handy platform for Jamie George, who's in a consultation with Dan Cole, who gives him the call. And George prepares to throw. Can England get their set piece ticking smoothly? As George throws to a toe, Jay goes back to George, and then George kicks it down the touchline. Colby read it, but again it looked a planned move, and again those little bits of innovation that England needed to come into the game with didn't quite come off, but it's something. Good. No, good. Good. I mean, it was, it was a shame that uh, Jamie George kicked it, and, and I, I think that that's off the training park, uh, off the training park field position. But also, have a look up, Jamie, have a look up. You've got to keep hold of the ball. Well, it was a free kick uh, to England after Farrell called the mark. South Africa take the line out quickly, and they send the ball, which is brilliantly taken by Billimser. Has he gone out of play? Yes, he has. So England, after all that, will have the line out 
on their own 10 meter line three minutes left of the first half he's such a physical athlete uh, Damien Willems I mean he got that ball and then almost actually kept it in what a lovely piece of play Oh, and Farrell, that was a cracking kick. I mean, he was almost in, on near the South Africa 22. Luckily that for South Africa, Pollard thought quickly and got it back out so Willemse could kick the up and under. England throwing into the line out on their own 10-metre line with a couple of minutes left of this first half. Jamie George delays his throw, then goes to the tail. Nicely done, Courtney Laws at the back. Laws, one of these England forwards who started that World Cup final four years ago. And so far, so good for England. A much improved showing, but... Their lead is only three. Mitchell again with the box kick. This is very contestable, maybe a metre or two shorter than he would have liked. Up goes Colby. Well, there's going to be a penalty to England here. I think some kind of blocking. Let's listen in to Ben O'Keefe. Obstruction. Your view of that, Paul Grayson on the touchline. Colby went up, he was clattered. In front of you. But there was a bit of a block by the spring box. Farrell now will kick for goal from the penalty. We commented early, early on about the quality of the escort runners from England, giving Freddie Stewart plenty of space and time to get up and contest the ball. Johnny May got through all those spring box there, nobody blocking him. Peter Steph Dutoy realised too late, then came in and stepped across uh, May. Dangerous that because he put Cheslin Colby in uh, in a dangerous position in the air, but well spotted by the referee. Poor from South Africa forwards in retreat, not cutting Johnny May off earlier. Yeah, very eagle-eyed spot by Ben O'Keefe. South African fans may argue a touch on the harsh side, but it's just another one of those calls, though, isn't it? Just, just the, the little 50-50s. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And often in these tight test matches, the 50-50s can go one way, can lead to momentum. The tiny little shifts that dictate these kind of games that are won on the most minuscule of margins. Farrell for 12-6, which might well be the half-time score with a minute to go till the buzzer. Long way out, nice strike, beautiful strike, straight through. That's as good as it gets from the England skipper. And you can just feel the energy around the stand from these England fans in white who have made the pilgrimage across the channel to witness mission improbable, but certainly not impossible. England lead by six on the verge of half-time. A huge 40 seconds coming up. Next job, isn't it? Next job. South Africa will want to get the pill back. England will want to go through a couple of phases, get it into the stands and get in the shed. Yeah, 30 seconds left. Can England just show a bit of composure or can South Africa get one last chance to make a dart on the scoreboard? 20 seconds left of the first half. England lead by six and they've been magnificent in these conditions, playing their style, their tactics. And they've got control of this World Cup semi-final, albeit with a very slender six-point lead. That will be it for half-time because England have done well to take it in field, set up a ruck, and then Alex Mitchell, who's had a fantastic first 40, early. he oh. kicks it out and he had to dance around his dead ball area. Matt Dawson is a nine with forwards hunting you down. That must have given you the creeps. But England lead by six in the World Cup semi-final, 12-6. Yeah, both sides sprinting off in there. England excited about what they've just done. I think South Africa know that they're probably in a little bit of a tailspin. Little bit of a right, Razzi, what do we need, need to do here? We need a bit of Erasmus magic, but from England's perspective, what a brilliant performance under the conditions, under the pressure. Awesome. And we said it all week, didn't we? Because, you know, what do semi-finals bring? They bring the increased pressure. Pressure. You're in a in a goldfish bowl all week, all tournament, and then it comes down to those matches where it's it's do or die. It's knock, you know, it's knockout rugby. England have turned up. They've changed their strategy a little bit, and they are implementing it perfectly. England, Sonia, 40 minutes away from the World Cup final. A Bok onslaught will come, but so far so good for the men in white. They lead 12-6. Well, we saw a complete no contest, didn't he? Didn't we last night between Argentina and New Zealand? This one, by contrast, is on a knife edge. It's totally absorbing. Do you remember Matt Dawson, Johnny Wilkinson's mum, when she was watching her son? She just she couldn't watch. She'd spend the whole game outside in the car park. Are you still? In, is your stomach still churning a little bit? I don't think it was unique to Johnny's mum. Don't worry, my, my mum. Everybody's, every sports person's mum, um, 
would struggle to watch their child play under these types of pressure environments. Uh, and obviously the physicality doesn't help either. Um, yeah, yeah it, it was, I was really quite satisfying from my perspective watching that England side. The conditions have been absolutely perfect for England. For, for that strategy, brilliant. And they've played it. I'm just keeping an eye on there. Is, England had a, had a bit of wind behind them in that half. If things will change. It, you know, South Africa, I'm sure down on the pitch, it probably felt like you were into a, you know, the driving rain. Um, therefore, having that on your back is an advantage. So England are going to be up against it in the second half. But why change, Song? Really? Yeah. Why change? And that's going to be difficult for England. When you've played that well, it is very difficult in the changing room to say, come on, let's just keep what we're doing. You often need something to spark you up and get you get your head in the game ready for the for the half so it's going to be a, I think this will be a tougher half for England than it will be for South Africa who obviously got lots to improve ground staff are out with their pitchforks Grace if anything it's getting heavier isn't it the rain which actually does that slightly play into England's hands because so far it's been a tactical masterclass hasn't it from Borthwick and Sinfield yeah it has and let's not kid ourselves this is page one of wet weather rugby the difficulty yeah. with it is it, it, there's no rocket science here it's implementation accuracy focus everything that we talk about champion teams doing and we haven't seen it that often from this England team so far but given the opportunity to step up against South Africa and deliver a half of wet weather rugby where they've maybe only made two or three unforced errors to maintain that arm's length score of of six points it's been absolutely superb and I think we've probably just had a little look into just how much South Africa had to put into last week to beat France here because from the off they looked a little bit not going to say leggy but certainly weren't at anywhere near as intense as they were in passages um, last weekend and they'll have to right the wrong also with making no changes in their team and coming into a, a, a wet weather game that's not changing tonight with um, Manny Libok at 10 Kobus Reinach at 9 oh, I've seen a lot of Kobus when he's at Northampton He's an instinctive player. He's not a he's not a game plan player. Breathtakingly fast, and we've seen a little bit disjointed in the way South Africa have gone about their business tonight. Libok already off. No news, I guess, from anybody up there whether he's injured or not. But that's a massive change. Twenty odd minutes into a semi final of a World Cup. Yeah, we'll see what bearing that heroic victory over France will have on the Springboks in this second half. We will go back for second half commentary with unfancied England currently still a long way to go leading the world champions by 12 point to 6 at the break let's get a quick update from Bramall Lane Sheffield United against Manchester United John Bennett seconds away from half time Sheffield United won Manchester United won Manchester United ending this half really strongly Fernandes has hit the bar and Hoyland forced a great save from Wes Fodderingham Sheffield United won Manchester United won Right, we'll have the second half in Paris coming right up. First news with Stuart Clarkson. Listen on BBC Sounds. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. Tributes have been paid to Sir Bobby Charlton, who's died aged 86. The Prince of Wales, who's the president of the FA, has described him as a true great who'll be remembered forever. David Beckham said Sir Bobby was a true gentleman, a family man and a truly a national hero. And 1966 England World Cup winning teammate Jeff Hurst says he will be sorely missed by all of the country beyond sport alone. Here's the former England striker Alan Shearer. He was iconic, he was a legend and he'll be remembered forever because of because of who and what he was. I mean, he had an unbelievable career, um, but he was such a nice guy. He was so down to earth um, and whenever you were in his company, there was always just kindness came from him. How are you doing? What are you doing? What are you up to? Where are you going? It's, he, was, uh, he was a wonderful man. A book of condolence will be open tomorrow morning at Old Trafford. Manchester United says it's discussing how best to commemorate Sir Bobby's life ahead of Tuesday's home Champions League fixture. We'll have more tributes here on Five Live with Stephen Nolan from 10.15 tonight after the rugby. A group of UN agencies has called for a ceasefire and unrestricted humanitarian...
humanitarian access to Gaza after 20 lorries carrying aid were allowed to enter the Palestinian territory earlier today. UNICEF, the World Food Programme and the WHO say action is needed to save lives and prevent more suffering. And six severe flood warnings remain in place in communities across the UK tonight. The storm Babette continues to cause major disruption. The alert, the alert, which means there's a danger to life, has been issued for the village of Llantrinu in Powys and in parts of Derbyshire. Three people have died during the storm and one person is missing in Aberdeenshire. On BBC Sounds. Newscast is the unscripted chat behind the headlines. It's informed, but informal. We pick the day's top stories and we find experts who can really dig into them. We use our colleagues in the newsroom and our contacts. Some people pick up the phone rather faster than others. We sometimes literally run around the BBC building to grab the very best guests. Join us for daily news chats. To get you ready for today's conversations. Newscast. Listen on BBC Sounds. Every game live. Rugby World Cup 2023 on 5 Live. Radio 5 Sports Extra and the BBC Sport website. With Sonia McLaughlin. Welcome back to the Stade de France. Second half commentary coming up of England against South Africa with England currently leading the world champions 12 points to six. Four penalties from the boot of Owen Farrell. England playing some very smart wet weather rugby and they have got the South Africans on the back foot. One game in the Premier League this evening. Sheffield United taking on Manchester United. John Bennett is at Bramall Lane where it's now half time, John. And it's 1-1 at half-time, Sonia. Sheffield United started the half strongly. Manchester United ended it strongly, although it was Manchester United who took the lead. Scott McTominay scoring again, bringing down a Bruno Fernandes pass, volleying into the back of the net. But then six minutes later, McTominay handball in the box. The referee gave a penalty. VAR check, the penalty stood, and Ollie McBurney equalised. The former England goalkeeper Paul Robinson is alongside me. United, Manchester United struggled at times, didn't they, Paul? What have you made of that first half? They have. Sheffield United have been excellent. We know the injury problems that they've had before this game. It's kind of a makeshift team that they've put out tonight. They've done extremely well tonight against Manchester United. They've pressed them high and they've, they've played them at their own game. And to be fair, Manchester United have really struggled at the back. They've got the two at the back and Johnny Evans and Harry Maguire. Ollie McBurney and Cameron Archer have really caused them trouble. They got the penalty and it's nothing more than they deserve. United have slowly come back into this game. Marcus Rashford's been very, very quiet this first half. But the last five, ten minutes of the half, he's really sprung to life. Him and Fernandes. And the, the main goal threat from United, surprisingly, is McTominay, who's playing higher up the field tonight in the number ten role. Yeah, and just before half-time, Bruno Fernandes hit the bar. So positive signs for Manchester United. Half-time, Sheffield United won, Manchester United won. Thank you very much indeed. Now we're going to reflect uh, on the sad news today, of course. You've been hearing it, I'm sure, that the footballing great Sir Bobby Charlton has died at the age of 86. He won 106 caps for England, scored 49 international goals during a 17-year career with Manchester United. He won three league titles as well as a European and an FA Cup. Many have been paying tribute this afternoon, including Gary Lineker, who earlier spoke to Chappers about his memories of the great man. I was lucky enough to see Bobby Charlton play when I was I was a young boy. He was, in many ways, um, one of my heroes and, um, and many people's heroes. Um, it's, it's a very sad day. And um, I think, um, I mean, it's always difficult, isn't it, to judge the best ever. But I think Bobby Charlton was synonymous with English football for such a long time. He was one of those people that you could go to a country where no one spoke English in any yeah. part of the world and yeah. people would say, Bobby Charlton. And that, I think, is fame and testament to his abilities. When you watched him as a footballer as a kid then, what, what did you like so much about him? I think for someone that's a, a youngster at the time, um, scoring goals, it was his incredible finishing. I remember when I finished one goal short of him in my international <laughs> career and um, I'd been interviewed after that last game of, of my career and, and, and they were saying, you must be really disappointed. And I, I do remember making the point at that particular time that I said, well, if you'd have told me that one day I'd be one short of Bobby Charlton, I, I, I'd have snapped your hand off. And the other thing I said was that Bobby Charlton scored proper goals. He scored all sorts of goals. He could score them from outside the box. He could, you know, that, that incredible power and venom yeah. in his shots. That, that, and I think that was the thing that caught my eye um, very much in the early days. Charlton famously part of the England team who defeated West Germany 4-2 to 
to win the 1966 World Cup final after extra time. It remains the greatest day in English football. Charlton and his brother Jack, of course, both in the team. There was a lot of good players to pick from. And Alf Ramsey came in 1963, I think. He brought in players maybe that Walter Winterbottom wouldn't have brought in. Players who probably the general public would have thought, well, he's not good enough to play for England. But they were good team people, you know. I don't think that my brother Jack maybe would have been picked. I certainly don't think Nobby Styles would have been picked because everybody expected an England player to do everything great and positive. Right. But at the same time, thinking professionally, you have to get somebody that's got to win the ball. And Alf Ramsey, the manager, he told us from the beginning, we are good enough, we will win the World Cup in 1966 because we have the best players. And prior to the World Cup in 1966, which most people seem to have forgot, is that we went everywhere in the world and won. We were almost unbeaten anywhere. It wasn't because we were playing at home that we were the favourites. Our track record over the, the previous two years, we'd beaten almost everybody. When we won in 1966, the manager was right, all his staff were right, the players right throughout the squad. You know, they were the right players, they were good enough to do it. The standard of play, the standard of player was so good. Every team that you played against, you know, was a really tough match, hard match. And I remember when we won the match, we beat Germany in the final 4-2, and uh, Jack said to me, he said, well, what about that kid, you know? And I said, well, our lives will never be the same again after this. And it hasn't been that. There has never been a day since that that someone hasn't mentioned the World Cup in 1966. The Springboks are out early. They're in a huddle on the pitch. More reaction on Stephen Nolan, who follows us around 10.15 to the sad news today of the death of Bobby Charlton. Earlier in the 5.30 kickoff in the Premier League, Arsenal came from behind to rescue a point away to Chelsea with Leandro Trossard equalising in the 84th minute to make it 2 all. Let's hear from Chelsea boss Maurizio Pochettino. Well, disappointed. The game was under control. We didn't concede too many chances. Um, yes, in the way that we conceded, I think we changed the momentum and, and give more belief to, to Arsenal. Yes, and then it's, it's, it's the possibility, you know, you always you can concede, but I think we need to rescue the, the, the positive thing because the team was really, really competitive and I was so happy with the performance. I know it's a draw, but lots, you feel like there are lots of good signs today. You know, you've got a little injury problems, but it's coming together slowly. Slowly, slowly, yes, because one thing is to have the player available and another that are informed to compete in the best, no, like in the case of, of Rhys. I think with time, I think uh, recovering players, we are going to be really competitive and then to give the chance, you know, to all the players to, to have the possibility to compete for the, the position, the place, and increase the level of the, of the team. Can I just ask you about Sir Bobby Charlton, sadly passed away today, just yeah. your reflections on a no, great my, man? My reflection is a very sad day when uh, I knew an unbelievable icon for football and for, for the sport that we love, no? and that is why we are going to miss a very, very sad, sad moment. Today, of course, also is England against South Africa at the Cricket World Cup, where England's title defence hanging by a thread after a 229-run thrashing by South Africa in Mumbai. It's a, a different twist here at the minute because England are leading the world champion South Africa 12 points to six. The players, both sets, back out on the pitch. Oh, England, could they? Could they really? 40 minutes away from a World Cup final. Potentially, Chris Jones. England 12, South Africa 6. Bobby Skin's dad, Matt Dawson, Paul Grayson with us. Tell you what, Bobby, the box have been out for ages, haven't they? Yeah, yeah they came out quite early, made a circle. England slowly sauntered onto the field after that. But South Africa will want to start a lot quicker than that. Who scores first in this second half? How crucial will every score be? How crucial will every moment, every catch, every pass, every decision? England lead by six, it was a first half tactical masterclass. Page one of wet weather rugby, the verdict from our man on the touchline, Paul Grayson, as Alex Mitchell, like he's done all first half, clears his lines competently, Matt Dawson, although it gives the box a handy attacking line out just in front of the 10 metre line in English territory. Yeah, I, I know they have been going to touch, but I, th I think Alex Mitchell's got to hit that a little bit longer. If it stays in the five-metre channel, no problem whatsoever. But territory so important. And then again, what do we talk about? Wind slightly changed. And they don't quite get it clean at the line-out, do South Africa. And it's got to be so encouraging for England there. Players, coaches and supporters that those pillars of South African rugby, scrum, line-out, mall, have not been 
as overwhelmingly dominant. And then the kicking game's faltered too. Reinhardt goes high, and it's back in the hands of Tom Curry. England just winning those 50-50s, and they have it short of halfway through. Mitchell, who goes back to Farrell, who sends a big high tower in crossfield, kick towards Johnny May. Up goes May with Krill. May wins it, and it's quite unlucky they haven't got there. His back back ends up with Joe March Chen having to dive on the ball. Willems is looking to steal. And it's a penalty to England as the box pile off their feet. And Paul Grayson on the touchline. Again, a few little 50-50s going England's way early on. Yeah, but the importance of the kick endorsed that first kick from Alice Mitchell. You said at half-time, England up. possibly into a bit of a breeze. Maybe that was reflecting why the ball didn't go quite so far. But then an absolute shocker from Cobus Ryan, like a box kick that just went straight up in the air. England win the bouncing ball, go to the air, then win the breakdown. So they have to get desperate to get their hands on the ball, but their lack of accuracy, as opposed to England's excellent accuracy, is what's hurting them the most at the moment. Yeah, great start for England. They've made a lot with a little, and South Africa seem to have made a little with a lot. The voices of World Cup winners, one, Paul Grayson and Bobby Skinstad, Matt Dawson's with us too. One, one shot wonder there in the second half. Oh. Cobra, get the shepherd's hook, get off the field. Erasmus has said... Reinhardt off the pitch, both the clerk on. Both starting halfbacks have been hooked for South Africa. So Reinach and Libok off, and the pair that started the World Cup final four years ago, Faf de Klerk and Andre Pollard on, as England win the line out. South Africa rushed up, so Mitchell had to dummy. Looks like he's going to box kick from deep inside the South African half. Has that gone a millimetre or two too far? No, it looks pretty contestable. England win it. Back it comes to Atoje. Atoje offloads to Marla, and England have it short of the 22. What can they do now when they get real good field position? Martin flips it on to Curry. Curry. Sets it up, now out to Farrell, he shapes the kick, he does kick, that's found a lot of grass, that's good from Farrell, South Africa in loads of trouble in the corner, and it's out, and it's England ball because Willemsen lost it, and what an opportunity this is. Great kick, Owen Farrell, great kick under all that pressure, just that little nudge, cross field, grubber kick through, at best South Africa were going to gather it and get tackled into touch, but it was a tricky one. I, thought, I like that tactic, Bobby. Yeah, I thought it was smart. You're right, George. I tell you the one other thing. At every instance, the England players are all smiling. They're laughing and talking and geeing each other on. You can see the South African faces are getting drawn and worried. Oh. Another change. That should, that should be a South African ball. That's actually come off uh, Elliot Daly's knee. Rubber the green, not really not going for South Africa. Another change as well. From the South African coaches, they have gone for experience. Look at that. Reinert, Libok, Willems are all off. De Klerk, Pollard and Willy LaRue all on. But this is as good as it gets as an attacking platform for England. Five metre line out. They lead by six. A converted try would be a huge lead in these conditions. They've not thrown it straight. It's happened a few times for South Africa. This time it's England's turn to falter at the line out. And it will be a South African scrum, albeit just five metres from their own line. Massive, Chris. Absolutely huge. And it, and it wasn't straight, unfortunately, because Marotodi had to bend his body towards England's side. It was very obviously not straight. Massive moment in the game. Huge moment, possibly defining moment in this game because 11 points, 13 points in these conditions. And you That's get almost good enough to win, it's, isn't it? It's close, Bobby. It's got to be close, yeah. Yeah, no one likes uh, chasing a game, let alone in conditions like this. So there we go. Still got to get out of a pressure situation. Sure. Yeah, the exit is vital. Absolutely, they do. 45 minutes gone, five lives bought from the BBC. Wherever you are at home, in your car, out for a walk because you can't stand the tension, do not go anywhere. A swing low, sweet chariot rings around the Stade de France. You don't often hear that sung here, the home of French rugby, where France have been so dominant recently, and it could have been France who lost that thriller against South Africa last Sunday. And the box look to clear their lines after winning quick heel at the scrum, back from the clerk to Pollard, who has plenty of time, all that experience, all that composure. But it's not a long way out, it's just outside the 22. England still on the attack. Are you, are you expecting people to be listening this, to this 
because it's too exciting to watch on TV. Have you ever listened to the radio? It's so exciting on the radio. I think it's more exciting on the radio. <laughs> I'm just trying to picture where our listeners are at the moment. What's happening here? Edzabeth's coming off. Okay, uh, Snowman's gone on for I- Ibn Edzabeth. But come on, Bobby, you don't take Ibn Edzabeth on uh, off on 45 minutes normally. I know that they're innovative with their bench, but that is that is rare. Certainly not without asking oh. nicely. Well, Jamie George has gone to throw without asking nicely. Jamie George has gone to throw at the line out and it's just slipped out of his hand. You know, sometimes in cricket when someone goes to bowl it, it just goes up in the air. So I imagine it's gonna be a South African scrum or, or free kick for not going five, but they'll probably clear their line South Africa and that'll be play on. The clerk does clear an advantage over is the call from referee Ben O'Keefe. Forward comes Daly, he loses it. So South Africa just edging that kicking game and then we will go back for the scrum. South Africa, though, have gone from outside, or basically their own five-metre line, to almost up to halfway. And literally haven't done a thing right, but England have done three things wrong, and that's the only way they've managed to exit their own, you know, their own danger zone, South Africa. They've really thrown everything in here because it's a bit off. I mean, I know Snayman is a, is a like-for-like in size, but certainly not experience. What, I mean, it is going to be quite tricky to get across this, but the, the tiredness of both of these teams on 45 minutes, it's been so attritional. There have been massive collisions, loads of pick and going. Everybody is thinking about making the contact, tucking the ball up, making contact, getting up, getting down, getting up, getting down. It's so attritional in this game that the sort of standard and the flow of the game has completely disappeared. And the, the less flow, the more tiring it is. And South Africa at the moment are, they look like they're at six, sixes and sevens. They look out of position. They don't know whether who's going to kick and how far they're going to kick it. No wonder that South African coaches have turned around and said, we need to make a massive change. We need to make a statement because we're not winning this game with those players, those decision makers in those positions. I, I admire that. But if I was in the England side, I'll be saying, look look where we are. Look what we've got. Let's do the basics really well. And South Africa are going to crack. Paul Grayson, under your umbrella on the touchline. Yeah, um, amazing, really. What a difference a week makes. It was about this time, wasn't it, when Sia Khaleesi got taken off. They changed 9, 10 and 15 for the three who've just come on now. They empl- deployed the bomb squad and it was, it was like, right, here we go. And they overwhelmed... France in the second half they were they were dominant now they're making those same changes but because Libek had a shocker uh, Reinach had a shocker Epsabeth looks low on energy and they've always said as soon as you lose your intensity you're gone so they're making those moves because they have to not because they want to but Grace you've been with us all week on the Rugby Union Daily as this scrum struggles to set will England rue the first five of this half when they've had good set piece opportunities and not been able to add to their score no, I don't, because I, th- I think even though they've made those couple of mistakes, the high kick went up there and Daly lost it forward, but it was an England player who was quickest to respond. They got a boot to it and hacked it forward. Yes, they come back for the scrum and the advantage, but but the, the response to the incident, the white shirts are just moving quicker than the green at the moment. Well, this scrum is taking an age to set, so let's go to John Bennett at Bramall Lane. Sheffield United won, Manchester United won, and the home side flying out of the blocks in this second half. Ollie Norwood with a good effort just over the bar. They're doing really well, the home side. Only one point remember remember this season, but they are testing Manchester United. It's 1-1. Thanks, John. That was a solid England scrum because South Africa went to work. They kept it in, desperately trying to milk a penalty. Faf de Klerk urging on his forwards. Part of those old England war horses, Marler and Cole, held firm. And now England have ripped it away from South Africa. And they have it through a toe. Jays having a big game. Courtney Law's out to Marla. Marla just short of halfway. England lead by six. England 12, South Africa 6 on Five Live Sport and BBC Sounds. Eight minutes gone of this second half as the rain continues to swirl around the stad. England will go to the boot. It's what they've done all day and they've done it with such efficiency. Another kick from Mitchell, but this time it's gone out on the full. And I wonder, Matt Dawson, when does Steve Borthwick look at his bench, look at these starters who have emptied the tank, and when does he go, OK, fresh legs might be required, or is it still a bit early? I think it's a bit early for England, England look in control. 
Defensively, they look really good. I mean, they've stripped the South Africans there. The, the South Africans, again, they look loose. They look individual. Day Lande taking the ball up and trying to fend off with one hand and hold the ball in another. In these conditions, tuck it under two. Take the contact. Run as hard as you possibly can. England are swallowing this all up. So, to answer your question, Chris, I, uh, right now, in the next five minutes, I don't see where England need to make any changes. South Africa throwing to the line out. It's loose. Khaleesi loses the ball. It looks like it's a bar of soap. But South Africa are miles off their usual accuracy. And they are just short of halfway, 15 metres in from the far touch line. And Faf de Klerk will go to the boot. And six points just feels a decent lead. Can England better it? All oh, South Africa comes storming back. Stewart is up. Oh, what a take, Freddie Stewart. And he's broken a few tackles. And he sets it up. England in better conditions, in different circumstances, may have looked to play that, but they didn't. Mitchell throws a dummy as South Africa rushed up, so no one is there to kick. And this is where Matt Dawson and England need composure with their scrum off on the floor. Every little moment of this game could end up being influential. A yeah, little, little pick and go, Maro toes, you go around the corner, take no risk, there you go. Tuck it under the jumper, make sure we get Alex Mitchell to his feet, and boom, that ball. Well, as Green, described on, by England's World Cup winning scrum half, Mitchell is now on his feet, and it's another pinpoint box kick. Daly is looking to get to that one. It's ended up in Springbok possession. They made a change. We'll get Bobby's view on that. They're emptying their bench early here, South Africa. Oxen Che is on. Oh, it's a knock on. It's a knock on by South Africa. Listen to the noise from the England fans who are growing in confidence around Paris. Scrum to England in South African territory. Bobby? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, South Africa have had very little to, to be pleased about in their own game. England gave them a few exit plans of their own. And uh, Ben O'Keefe seems to have their number this evening. He's, he's onto everything, every mistake that South Africa are making. And on the back of that, well, before South Africa realised it was going to be a mistake, that's the first time it's you've seen Pollard, Pollard, yeah. Pollard think, we've got to have a go here, we've got to go a little bit wider. It just, just the whiff of desperation from South Africa, again, messaging onto that England side. Keep doing what you're doing. Squeeze them. Look what South Africa are doing. They're trying to spin it wide. The box kicks. They don't care if they win this 12-6, 15-9. England don't care. Well, a bit of a break for water and the odd player getting treatment. England subs are up, but not yet stripped off and ready to go. Khaleesi's coming off, so is Vermeulen. I don't know, guys. I think he's emptied his whole bench now. Maybe Vincent Koch is the only one left. There's Quagga Smith in the back row as well. He's come on for Vermeulen. Snyman is on as well and it's all changed for South Africa up front. We asked where everyone was listening to, to us. BBC Cricket's Ali Mitchell's got in touch. Stuck at Gatwick Airport but she's with us all the way with England half an hour away from the World Cup final. England 12, South Africa 6 and Bobby Skinstad. We know they like to empty their bench early but a lot of this is is, is, is reactive rather than proactive from the box. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it feels like that certainly to us because they look and look and feel disorganised. I mean, it's not it's not like the South African team that we've seen. And to be honest, they've given a couple of kilos away as well to this next scrum. So England will feel that they can... Oh, my goodness, that's a, that's a big push. Big push by South Africa. Dion Ferri has come on on the flank as well. The reserve hooker, who's a hybrid player. So it's an all-new back row for South Africa. And they've gone to work on the England scrum. And de Klerk finds RJ Snyman just short of the 10-metre line. Ominous power play from the world champions. Crossfield from Pollard. Lovely little kick through. Willie LaRue might be onto this. He kicks with his right foot. Oh, it's beaten him. I thought LaRue was going to take that from Colby's inside ball. Wow. And that is a big warning sign from South Africa. First of all, the scrum, then the Pollard kick. Beautiful skill from Cheslin Colby. Willie LaRue was very close to scoring the try that could have put the box ahead. One touch. One softer touch. Only by... What do we think? Three, three meters, four meters. Yeah, movement that's, that's on the bench down here, boys. Maximum. Looks like the England bench also empty, emptying now. Danny Kerr, Genge, warm, warm, warming up. Well, this is um, a sign, isn't it? 
of the, the unique nature of World Cup semi-finals. And when you're England, the unique nature of playing against South Africa. Sometimes Steve Borthwick's held his bench back until 60 or 70. This time, Genge, Chesham, Kerr, all on for Marla, Martin and Mitchell. All three have been really good today. Yeah, yeah, proper solid there. All three of them deserve that little sort of guard of honour from the rest of the bench. Huge, huge moments coming up. Oh, my goodness me, Elliot Daly, what a hit. Oh, great chase from England and they've turned South Africa over and Genge takes it from Earl's Pass and look at that intervention from Ellis Genge over the 10 metre line there for care out to the ubiquitous Earl centre field 37 metres out or so England care digs for it Farrell drop goal miles out he's got the distance what a strike from Farrell what a kick from Owen Farrell one of the great drop goals miles out on the angle a captain's moment from the England skipper to put England nine clear in Paris. Brilliant decision, brilliant execution. Amazing. And, and these conditions to knock it over from what was probably 45 plus. What a difference, nine points now in these conditions. Right, Paul Grayson on the touchline, a man who's kicked 400 points for England. What a strike that was. That is a mega strike from Owen Farrell, an absolute dagger to the heart of South Africa. They thought they were going to score in this corner when the ball was pushed through after the cross kick. Hammer blow for them. Nothing. Four more of those and it'll be a repeat of 1999 quarterfinal, but the other way around. Go on, Owen Farrell. <laughs> oh, what moments these two proud rugby nations have had in Rugby World Cups, 1999, Yanni De Beer, 2007, the 36 nil, the final, which was won by the box, 2019 in Yokohama, and they're playing out another famous Rugby World Cup fixture here, England 15, South Africa 6, Bobby Skinstad, 53 minutes gone in Paris. Yeah, and it's just brilliant play from England there, you've got to take every opportunity that you get we realized there that suddenly they'd fractured the South African team that got over the ball that I think it was Cheslin Col Colby who was caught ball and all and in fact no it was Kirtley Arantzow who was caught ball, ball and all they they prized that ball away drove over it and then the attack up the middle of the field meant that Owen Farrell could drop into the pocket and wow I mean still from 47 odd yards away you know almost all of the 50 yards but what an amazing kick and great play from England on the attack. I feel South Africa have got to strike back now they've got literally minutes to strike back otherwise they're going to get desperate and in these conditions desperate ain't good enough that ain't going to wash. The world champions are up against it here England lead 15 to 6 as they peel away the box all those changes made up front, including bringing on Faree, their replacement hooker, on the flank. He plays both positions. This time, Quacker Smith drives on. South Africa attack, Pollard knocked on Creel. And is that just the tiniest sense of South Africa panicking? England will have the scrum, but they've got to keep playing. As Genge has it from Curry's pass. Okay. And Danny Kerr, who's come on, and it was his pass back to Farrell, who landed that epic drop goal. Surely 50-odd metres on the angle. As Kerr kicks, gone for distance, couldn't go to touch. LaRue takes it in. Willie LaRue skating around the backfield, just short of the halfway line. 25 minutes left on five live, live at the Stade de France as Pollard goes for a wiper kick. Freddie Stewart well positioned, he took that like he was at square leg, a top edge, just going over his shoulder, backtracking, takes it, calls the mark. Magnificent hands, falling, pedalling backwards, feet sort of tripping over himself, he was pedalling back so quick. As if he was falling down to deck, brilliant, brilliant catch from Freddie Stewart and really important because if that had gone to deck, England were in all sorts of trouble. Green three. Another change for England. Kyle Sinclair on for Dan Cole. That's a shift from Dan Cole. And England fans are on their feet. Four years on from his darkest day, he's come back and he's held the box at bay and more. And Kyle Sinclair's on 
to provide his dynamism. 25 minutes to go, England with the mark, so Stewart prepares to clear. 15-6 to Steve Borthwick's men, back to Bramall Lane. And John? It's still Sheffield United won, Manchester United won, an even game, chances for both sides, but Marcus Rashford inches away from giving Manchester United the lead. Tight angle, just wide. Sheffield United won, Manchester United won. Nice one, John Bennett at Bramall Lane. And South Africa have the line now. Freddie Stewart's kick was very, very solid. All eight changes now made by South Africa with Vincent Cock on for Franz Malherber on the tight head. Just about one by Snyman. Faf de Klerk, out it goes to Smith. Big collision. Ellis Genge putting his body on the line. That's exactly what you need from your replacements. So because South Africa lost that collision, they have to kick. De Klerk to Pollard. Real tester for Stewart. Oh, that's brilliant. He's taken another one, Freddie Stewart. And England are really quick to clear their lines and look at Curry just saying don't go yet to Danny Kerr it feels as if England Matt Dawson are absolutely bang on it with this game plan just in control and you, you just described why what show why they're in control is because other players are telling the other players what to do they're in sync another great kick from Danny Kerr yeah, there you go kick. yeah knocks on England turnover Farrell kicks this might work out Daly's after it back goes Aaron so who loses it and he knocks on and that's a scrum to England five meters out or is it was it first yet yeah, the first knock was South Africa oh England are just executing this to a tee. The high kick from Kerr, knocked on South Africa, boot through it by Farrell. Aaron's are panicked in the backfield. England have a scrum five metres out there. I say it, Matt Dawson, they could go really close oh, to putting this World Cup semi-final to bed. It, it's, a, it's a big shout, but there's, there's still Let's plenty go, of time to go. But for me, South Africa are gone. I'm sorry if you're South African England fans, but they look Mute gone, Bobby. They look looking absolute disarray. Yeah, England are just implementing so beautifully. I mean, nothing is going wrong for them. Every ball that, that has been kicked into the night sky is accurate. It's on the spot. South Africa are battling to deal with it and not able to try and snaffle the ball or get a, a body over the ball and get it back. And that's what we said tonight would be about accuracy. England are full of it. South Africa have none. Well, Steve Borthwick's laughing in the coach's box. Nervous laughter, surely. But rarely has could a team have, have executed a tactical plan quite like this. It is still a long way to go. Not even at the hour mark. But we can't keep stressing the conditions here in Paris. No tries yet, just kicks. 15 points from Owen Farrell. England have more than a foothold. They've got their foot buried in the ground here. England 15, South Africa 6 on the hour. They prepare to feed the scrum. Danny Kerr. Oh, it splintered that scrum. And this is going to be... Real pressure on Ben O'Keefe because the box, since all those new players have come on Bobby Skinstead, including the outstanding scrummager Oxen J, the scrum has suddenly started to splinter all over the place because of the pressure. Can you blow that? Yeah, I think they, uh, they're having a conversation with Ben O'Keefe there. They, they seem to be tight enough, so they're having better scrums in the last five or six minutes, but they haven't had the dominance, near the dominance that they need to take them away from England yet. Yeah, England with Swinglow Street chariots ringing in the stadium here. England got to get the ball in and out here, uh, Chris. C can't take any risks. South Africa had ever so slight nudge on the previous scrum. And Ben Earl, so fast, so speedy, elusive. Get the strike, Jamie George, strike to eight. Eight, get into the midfield. Maybe even a little pop ball to Manitou Alangi. Only five metres out. Hour oh, gone, England 15, South Africa 6, care fees, a lot of pressure coming on this scrum. Penalty, South Africa, that was coming. And this is the big moment in the game, we're going to say that a lot over the next 20 minutes. But South Africa have now got a semblance of scrum dominance. Paul Grayson on the touchline, your view of that one? Yeah, you're right, they have made the change in the front row. Sinko was the, the last to go on for Dan Cole, who'd done superbly well. We saw it in the, not the previous scrum to the, the one that just broke up there, but the one before that when it was an almighty shove from South Africa that England got away from. You feel that probably at the moment is the only bright spot for South Africa. You know, remember we were talking in the build-up about England, the way England could get over South Africa, targeting the small wingers with the ball in the air, sticking the ball in behind them after they after they win it. They're, they're doing it absolutely perfectly, but that's the one ray of hope for South Africa is a uh, resurgent scrummage. Yeah, those veteran 
props. We mentioned the 33-year-old Joe Marler, 36-year-old Dan Cole, how well they did. But then both now off. There's the dynamism of Genj and Sinclair, but not quite that technical expertise at the scrummage. South Africa go down the short side, Bobby Skinstad. And they made another mistake there. I think um, it looked like Dion Ferry going up the short side. This little pass, and then what a tackle by Danny Kerr. Outstanding on Bongi and Manambi. Now they want to put pressure on the England line out. I, I, I do feel, Matt Dawson, that was a moment. If England had scored even a three pointer there, South Africa had gone. Maybe there's just a ray of hope for them with 20 minutes to go in this match, but they're going to need to score very, very quickly. It's just so difficult to, to play with the ball in hand. And England have got nine points. They're going to leather the ball off first or second place. South Africa have to play, and it's, it's too difficult to be doing it from. 50 yards out. Oh, good drill, England. A Toje in the line out. Curry comes storming away, Tom Curry. He told us yesterday he was bouncing off the walls. England were fresh as a daisy, and they have been true to that prophecy. The ball bobbling around. Tuolangi is hit hard. England did win that kick contest, but then South Africa. Oh, a Toje. Brilliant, Mario Toje. Ben Earl stepping, and Ben Earl over halfway. That's excellent from Earl. Been lost forward though, has it? Yes, it has in the tackle by Earl. So neither side able to keep control of the ball. LaRue will go crossfield for Aaron's advantage over. Johnny May's got it as Ben O'Keefe called advantage over. And England, have they lost that forward? Yes, they have. Oh, just both teams starting to make mistakes, aren't they? It's so you, you're right, Matt. It's so hard to to uh, to handle the ball. I mean, it's slippery underneath. Let alone with you know with the rain pelting down into. I saw, I saw Green going forward first. Really, 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 really need that. Oh. When yeah. did he come in though, sir? It's hard for him to stay down. I thought it was fair. You just watch 18 angle for me. Okay, time's going back on. You heard Jamie George there. Watch 18 angle. Vincent Koch, the replacement prop. But South Africa, Bobby, went cross field from that kick. Willie Larue to Colby, both brilliant at that kind of thing, but inside their own territory. Yeah, and it doesn't look like a dangerous kick. You know, the one in the 22 looked like a dangerous kick. That looks like a panic kick. You know, I've got nothing else. You know, you, I think if you're South African, you want to be able to carry the ball, get into England's territory, but they're not able to do that because they're knocking on every couple of seconds. We've got to get, South Africa have got, have got to get their, their kicking game. Sorry, they've got to get the ball on the deck via there. But if we get teams coming on, I will then penalise them as well. Okay. Can, I go, can I go to the bench, please? Yes. Can we control? I've told him as well. Can we control that, Bongi? They tell us now. They came on first. I, I agree. I'm talking, about, I'm talking to both teams. Okay. okay? We need to keep the game moving. Yeah, referee Ben O'Keefe there. Sorry, man. Just talking about, you know, water carriers and medics and everyone coming on the pitch and just slowing the game up. And uh, that's been a, that's a lot of... Yeah, we, with the privileged access we get to the referee's mic, there is so much chatter going on. Jamie George talking now. Bongi and Manamba, he was the captain with Sia Khaleesi going off. OK, we're going to restart. Um, and finally, there will be a restart. Well, you've got Kevin Simfield as a, as a water carrier, haven't you? So there are going to be plenty of messages that he will be desperate to get on the field. So Owen Farrell's just said, listen, Kev, let's just hold off. What you don't want to do is give a ridiculous penalty away for the bench coming on the field that would be absolutely ridiculous so good captaincy from Owen Farrell right long stoppage here 17 minutes to go it's suddenly 63 minutes on the clock England 15 South Africa 6 the scoreline when the box won the World Cup here in the stad in 2007 Bobby Skinstad to my left part of that World Cup winning squad another penalty South Africa and even though both Ellis Genge and Jamie George made their remonstrations to Ben O'Keefe, he's clear the box have ascendancy there and they'll be able to take this into English territory. And this scrum, Bobby Skinstad, might be the weapon the box needs to get back into this semi-final. Well, they need to get deep into English territory just to start an attack and it's a line-out 10, 12, 13 yards into... English territory here and just remember they've been battling to carry the ball so you can't have phases you've got to do something quite quickly so it's either a driving line and hope for another penalty to grab another 30 yards or try and win a penalty I somehow find, I find this amazing why, why you would cut the line out there you go England have stolen in the line out and Johnny May whacks his boot through it 
Um, it, it then ends up in the hands of Willie LaRue. Might be numbers here for Stafford. Good tackle, Manitou Alangi on Pollard. Yes. And England really working hard with the counter arc. Billy Van uh, Oli Chesham in there, Maro Atoje in there. Pollard. As uh, De Klerk finds Willie LaRue's got in his first super good carry from Snipe and one handed gets the offload away to Vincent Cock who trundles over halfway. Bit better this from South Africa, wide to Cheslin Colby, who runs straight into May, who tackles him stone dead. And he's trying to steal Johnny May as well, and it's a penalty, England! What an offensive play from Johnny May! And he celebrates right in front of Paul Grayson on the touchline, Grace. What a hit that was. Colby accelerated straight into Johnny May, two out-and-out -out speedsters. The collision was enormous after good skill in the middle of the field from, from Snayman. and... But then Johnny May just stayed in the contest, nobody hit him cleanly in the clear, had his hands on the ball, obviously a release because they, they bounced off each other in that original collision. Johnny May stood his ground and made his feelings known to the spring box. Yeah, it all came from a, why South Africa are cutting that line out when they have to go from set piece. England will be chuffed to bits that these decisions that South Africa are making even the players running straight at another player it's like this default all of a sudden South Africa are just going to go route one not using the brains using the brawn not enough brains good drill England George de Chesham who's on in the second row Tom don't Curry change, now comes change. in and oh, Danny Kell just stick this up in the air can he get the box kick right yeah, not great kick. bad maybe great kick. a tester for oh well taken Cheslin Colby Johnny May may have fancied that with his height advantage but Colby is regal in the air I'll tell you what both England number nines have kicked supremely today and it's been a huge part of this tactical plan that England promised and so far they've delivered with so far being the operative words England 15 South Africa 6 14 minutes to go in the stand that's too far from the clerk Freddie Stewart gobbles it up and skips past Snyman and almost gets past Mostot that's good from Stewart Care now, out to Farrell, who will go to the boot himself. Only gone about 10 metres, but another contestable, which is going to end up in English possession, but via a knock-on. So South Africa were at the scrum, and Bobby Skinstad, they've won a few scrum penalties. So if they again go to work, that's going to be a big weapon if they can win a penalty and take it up to the English 22. It is, but can they, though? I mean, you know, South Africa just looking a little bit shell-shocked, I have to say. I mean, they've been such an an organized smart team over the last couple of years and when you look at how they're playing at the moment they've got, they've got Vili LaRue coming in at 10 not necessarily making all the best decisions we've ever seen and, Eng and England absolutely munching them up in, in terms of opportunity well if you, if you look at the opportunities when South Africa are trying to attack you know it's it's tricky in the conditions to go through the hands so if they get some turnover ball they might go through one or through uh, two phases and Lily LaRue will kick the ball or Faf de Klerk will kick the ball but it's meat and drink to Freddie Stewart you'd rather you know, if you're England you're taking that all day long with, with supreme May Stuart Daly have been absolutely supreme so South Africa should be thinking about are they going to just little chips over or maybe a slightly shorter kick so it turns into a lottery rather than they're trying to do the classic box kick or up and under they, uh, but it's another example where they're in the mush they're in the we played against Ireland and Scotland and France and it was free flying and we were in lots of control and now we're absolutely shattered and we just don't know where to turn isn't it amazing what knockout rugby can do to even the very best players we're going to go to John Bennett at Bramall Lane shortly, but let's just see how this scrum unfolds, because we're getting to that point, aren't we, where every single moment could change the course of this World Cup semi-final. There, they, there you go, another penalty advantage. And South Africa have the penalty advantage from the scrum. They're looking to throw a wide ball through Pollard, but he loses it. Back for the penalty, three penalties in a row as Oxen, Che and Powell's go to work on England. Let's go to Bramall Lane, John Bennett is starting to dominate it's still 1-1 Sofian Amrabat with a rocket of a shot the bar is still rattling just nearly very close to a Manchester United winner Sheffield United won Manchester United won cheers John Matt Dawson well I was just uh, challenge I, I was challenging Bobby Skinstad there to maybe Pollard was going to go for a 55 meter with a win behind 
15-6, take it to 15-9. And Bobby Skinso, to his credit, was like, nah, no chance. And South Africa heard him. And I, I mean, Pollard has just absolutely creamed it into the corner 10 metres out. What a kick, Pollard. What an opportunity, South Africa. A whole posse of Springbok fans in the level above us have been reaching over and slapping the big Rugby World Cup signs. As Tom Curry comes off, Billy Vinopola now on permanently, you'd imagine. The atmosphere cranking up. But there'll be people who can barely bear to watch as South Africa win the line-up through Snyman. South Africa entering Muscourt territory and they're almost there. Quacker Smith, what a tackle coming in. He's just short of the line. The boxer inches away. De Klerk out to Snyman. No one's going to stop him. RJ Snyman scores. There's the Springbok power play. And they are right, right back in this World Cup semi-final. Oh, oh, my goodness me. South Africa sprinting, sprinting back to their half. Is that the moment that kicks this South African side into? England have got to regroup, regroup fast. That is only one, only one moment of the game. And there's not a lot they could have done about it. It was a brilliant penalty kick into touch from Pollard. Forget it. England, you are in control of this game. Keep doing what you are doing and you will have a chance to be in that final. What do we say about those butterflies? Yeah, they, they, they're they, not in formation they, they at were, all. Do you know what? For the previous, for the previous sort of 65 minutes, they've been like beautiful geese in V <laughs> formation, and now it's just like one of those enormous cloud of swallows, just like all over the place, different directions. No one knows what's going on. Oh, Pollard kicks goodness. the goal. Bobby England 15, South Africa 13. Ten minutes to go at the start. Well, we've been here before. What a lovely piece of play. I mean, you've got to say, from the line and everything went according to plan for the first time this match. And the big man, Akia Sneiman, over with a very kickable, convertible try. Ten minutes to go, England lead by two. Yeah, let's not underestimate the difference now with Tom Curry coming off around that. Yeah, the speed to the ruck, competing with and without the ball. Can, can Billy step up? What treatment, I think, for one of the South African forwards. Back to Bramall Lane, you've got a goal, John. Goal for Manchester United, Sheffield United 1, Manchester United 2. What a strike by Diogo Dallo. Just outside the box, a curler into the top corner. The keeper just got a touch, couldn't keep it out. Sheffield United 1, Manchester United 2. Thanks, John. Paul Grayson on the touch on your view of that Snyman try, which has just shifted the momentum. Beware the scrum, South Africa's power in that has brought them back into this game. Three scrum penalties, a great kick. As oh. Kerr gets bundled into touch, a great kick from Pollard to the line out and then blistering power from the Springboks pack. But England, they come from England mistakes. South Africa upper hand in their scrum, that is what will win them the game if it does. This is on the brink, isn't it? That was a good kickoff from England. It ended up in Danny Kerr's hands, but then he was... Whacked out of play, but England need to keep the ball down here. They make a mistake, they feed the box scrum, which has led to penalties, territories and tries now. England 15, South Africa 13, nine and a half minutes to go as Mostart off the line up after club. Bit of a wild pass, ask Pollard to take it. Do England think long-range drop goal here? Because Johnny May has it on his own 10-metre line. He will scamper over halfway and off he sets Johnny May. Another man with memories of Yokohama four years ago. Danny Kerr, he was in the international wilderness then. He's back in an England shirt. And he passes to Genj and he will go to the boot. They've got to make sure that they've got enough chasers. May, Laws and Earl are all poised to the right. This has taken a long time though from England and Kerr. Kerr trying to fish it back with his foot and referee O'Keefe allowing him to do so. He then kicks, perhaps a little bit too far. May's after it, Pollard will call the mark. And that's the one. They're the ones, aren't they? They're, I mean, a, a kick on the money, and they have been all day so far. Causes more mayhem. And now there's an opportunity for Pollard to really give it a good old shoe down there. If it goes to touch, he's not, he's not bothered whether it doesn't. Yeah, it's a free kick, so more about the distance as Stewart sends a kick up. Will he take his own kick, Stewart? He does, well, he gets it back to Atoje, who's having a storm of Maru Atoje. Like the Atoje of four years ago. Care out to Genj, Genj a little bit isolated, Peter Steph on him. He offloads to Billy Vanapola. 
I do wonder if Farrell will try another huge drop goal. He goes for a spiral bomb. Oh, like that, that is horrible for South Africa. Colby and LaRue. Well taken, Willie LaRue. He then calls the mark belatedly. And referee O'Keefe happy he was inside the 22. Yeah, well, the rule, the, the rule on that one, it was just inside the 22. The rule is you don't actually have to ask the referee for it. You just got to take a clean kick in the 22. That's scrum. why you see a lot of guys after the event, they put the... Yeah. put the, Here comes that scrum we spoke about Great last idea. week. Oh, my goodness. Great idea. What a what a call. They've won the last three scrum penalties. What a, what a weapon, isn't it? What a weapon. And that kick is a cracker. One of those wobbly spiral bombs from Owen Farrell. A yard outside the 22. Pretty and Billy LaRue gets absolutely mullered. And all of a sudden, it's a free kick. Great clear thinking from South Africa go to scrum you know you, we can see where the play is here so they are going to go for a penalty they're going to clear the line they're going to have the throw in dynamic changes well I think the game hangs in the balance here because they've had they've had a whole front row change England so they've got a much fresher bunch of people in in the scrum from the from the guys that gave all the penalties away Jamie George is still on though they have been asking this bloke to go the distance, Jamie George. At 33, his 84th cap. Theo Dan is a rookie on the bench. England's lack of depth at hook has been a problem for ages. George having to go the distance against two Springbok front rows. Yeah, it's just, honestly, Chris, it's one of these moments. It's one of these moments, this little break of play with a, that... That forward pack have to look at, look at each other now and say, this is the moment. Right now for England, this is a defining moment. No penalties. If, if South Africa just get the ball away and in play, that is a massive victory. South Africa are on their own 22, but they've been winning penalties at the scrum. Not that time. They get it away from the clerk to Pollard. Pollard kicks. Stewart scampers around the backfield. Two points in it. Five live from the BBC. Stewart goes high, but not very far. Can he regain it, Freddie Stewart? Not quite. He knocks on to us another South African scrum. So South Africa, perhaps more through accident rather than design, they've taken the play from their own 22 to the halfway line. They have another feed at the scrum and now we're in territory where they can kick for goal if they can win a scrum penalty, which they've been winning with regularity in this second half. I'm not sure I can do this anymore. I, I mean, I'm sitting here next to Dawson. We're friendly Should rivals. Should we ask we, one of these South African fans we, to step in, Bobby? We love each other to bits, <laughs> but we love beating each other. My goodness, I can't do this. We can't actually, you know... Should we just walk out the back of the stadium <laughs> and say... <laughs> I thought be... I'll be really honest, I think Bobby might feel the same. I'm not enjoying this. <laughs> I'm not. Oh the, my goodness. The brutal reality of top level knockout rugby. Five minutes to go and the game, I mean, it's staccato. It's slow in pace, it's stop start, but you cannot take your eyes off it. And hopefully for all of you listeners, you cannot take your ears off it. England 15, South Africa 13, but it's a Springbok feed at the scrum and Oxenche, Vincent Koch, et al. have started to get real scrum dominance and all eyes on not just these two forward packs but also referee Ben O'Keefe. They're going to reset at the scrum and Ellis Genge and Carl Sinclair are kind of in scrum of your life territory, aren't they? I think it's made a difference, Billy Vanapolo coming on as well in that back row. I think Tom Curry was struggling with his hip or his hamstring, probably couldn't give what he wanted to give they put in a proper shift like 16 shift. tackles in, in you know 60 odd minutes unbelievable shift from Kerry it just looked to me on that scrum at Eng England they looked like they sorted something out they looked like there was more it was more like parity ha if England have huge moments four and a half minutes to go South Africa will think they have the edge but England may well have sorted it time off oh it's a cacophony of noise in the stand. Swing low, sweet chariot, and look at some of these England fans heading across the channel, maybe more in hope than expectation. Sim, Billy LaRue there running over to the forward pack, and you know what he's saying. He is saying, this is it, boys. Give, give them one scrummage. England players look set, they look mean, they look in control. What a scrummage this is, pretty much on the halfway. I mean, we thought the previous one was important. I mean, this is Everest stuff right here. And the clock is still ticking. 
Only four minutes to go. Under four minutes to go. De Klerk taking his time. It's, it's a penalty, South Africa. Oh, this scrum. This scrum is proving the difference. And Pollard will kick for goal. And Pollard might well be kicking for the World Cup final. Lucid goes to me and then across. It's a very long kick, though. It's a very big kick, a long way away from... He went down on his knee first, Alice, and then he angles after. Keep the clock, rock, uh, keep the clock rock, running, for sure. OK, shot call. Going for goal, South Africa, from 50-odd metres. Big shot, massive shot. Grace, I mean, come on, you're the kicker, you're down there. It, it looks twice as long as it should be. Yeah, the... The rain stopped actually last couple of minutes, so there's nothing knocking it out of the sky, but it's cool down here now. So you won't get that amazing launch that we saw earlier in the tournament when it was really hot. It's probably everything he's got, to be honest, Andre Pollard. But he's the guy of all the South Africans you'd want on the field to have a crack. Andre Pollard with two and a half minutes to go. A penalty to South Africa. I make that four they've won at the scrum in quick succession. Here is Pollard. He kicks for the lead. What a strike. Has he got the distance? Easily! South Africa lead for the first time tonight. England 15, South Africa 16. And both Bobby Skinstad and Matt Dawson can barely speak. But one of you needs to. Well, it's the restart again. England still got a chance. They're going to start deep in South Africa's half. <clears throat> They're making another change. What a kick. What? George Ford's going to come on. England are going to try and position him for a match-winning drop goal. Yeah, Absolutely no. no chance that that's not going to happen. England will have two options, left and right, to cover. What an unbelievable kick. Can you only imagine what is going on in South Africa right now? Well, I reckon England have got Farrell and Ford on to split left and right and try and nail the drop goal. But the kickoff is taken by South Africa. Two minutes to go. England 15, South Africa 16. Ten unanswered points from the box. They've turned on the power at the scrum in the second half. And if they're going to get out of jail, the spring box, and keep that World Cup trophy in their grip, it'll be down to that weapon that four years ago made such a difference. 90 seconds left as the clerk hooks into touch. That's a fantastic kick from Faf the clerk. England will have to go from 50 with the line out. It's just world class. England can't do anything about that. And the only thing that is different now is England can't edge forward by kicking the ball away because South Africa have got the time advantage. This is it for England as Jamie George goes over the top. Farrell loses it. Nice hands care. George Ford out to Stewart. Just short of halfway. Good carry, Freddie Stewart. But England have to be so, so accurate. We're going into the final minute. It's a one point game. Sinclair, they've got room out here. England. Ford to Farrell. Farrell out to Ollie Lawrence, who's on. Lawrence bundles past Curly Aronson. They're not a million miles away from drop goal range as Kerr finds Sinclair, 40 metres out, one point in it. They're looking for the penalty, England, as South Africa don't roll. Out to George Ford, Ford to Billy Vanapola. Vanapola steps, Smith's over that ball, have South Africa moved away. There for Danny Kerr, but still a long way out. 47 metres, Kerr to Atoje, 30 seconds left, one point in it. England 15, South Africa 16, are they in drop goal range? Ellis Genge with a nice carry, Ben Earl, but the clerk's all over him. Still 45 metres at South Africa, push England back. Okay, Farrell's on. already dropped a massive goal, can he do one more? George Ford, Owen Farrell's in the centre now, Daly out to Courtney Laws. Perhaps the last game in England shirt for that modern day great of English rugby, Courtney Laws. A J drives on. But they're still 50 metres out, England, and they're not in drop goal range. And the clock is up. Final chance for England. Oli Lawrence down the short side. 47 metres out still. They've still got a long way to go. Can they milk a penalty? Can they drop a miraculous goal? England 15, South Africa 16, deep in stoppage time as Billy Vanapola drives on. Every single ounce of energy needed as England lose it forward and South Africa celebrate. And it's South Africa who go into the World Cup final and England are beaten and they look absolutely bereft out there. They simply couldn't have given any more.
They executed their plan to a T. But in the final quarter, that Springbok power just about proved decisive. England on their knees. Some of their heads are buried in the Stade de France turf. What a test match. Down to the wire. And it's South Africa still who are Rugby World Cup champions. And it's South Africa who will face New Zealand in a clash of the titans next Saturday night. But spare a thought, or many, for these England players who could not have gone deeper into the well. Full time in the semi-final, England 15, South Africa 16. And it's your boys, Bobby, who are back at the big time once more. Oh my goodness. To be honest, <clears throat> I'm lost for words here. It was a performance for the ages from England. They were absolutely outstanding all game long and South Africa by fingernails, by their fingernails, stayed in that game. There was real emotion and disappointment afterwards and you can see it. Some big men played some big games and in those final, final seconds of this match, South Africa, with the experience that they've had over the last couple of years, were able to scrape through. Certainly not a win that they will celebrate as one that they had easy and they'll have the utmost respect for an amazing England side and an amazing England performance. England fans in tears in the stands, Matt Dawson, their men couldn't have given any more. No, incredibly proud as every England supporter will be. What a, a, a an, an, just say impeccable win, it was an in, incredible performance from England, tactically, physically, mentally, they were sharp as a tack today. I mean, talk about fine margins, talk about opportunities, didn't we? And one, one opportunity from South Africa and they take the spoils and they should be applauded for it. But I mean, no one saw England coming out with that type of a performance. They, they were magnificent today and should be rightly proud. It's, it's no consolation. They're gutted, um, but they were you know, very, very proud to call that game and, and watch England put that sort of performance in. Paul Grayson, you put your brolly up again, your view from the touchline and then Sonia. Amazing from England. There was only one way to play tonight once we'd seen the forecast and it was accurate two days out. And as we went through the day, we knew it was going to be absolutely chucking it down from kickoff. They delivered their game plan. It's basic but brilliant. Their attention to detail in terms of their escorting players, giving uh, Freddie Stewart the opportunity to rule the airwaves was magnificent. The only exclamation point we'd put was that South Africa's scrum late in the game could be the difference, and that's exactly how it proved. A magnificent reserve front row have dug South Africa out of a massive hole because they were second best by a mile right until the set piece dominated at the end. And what a clutch kick from Andre Pollard, come back from injury, late to the party, but an absolute master stroke from near the halfway line to win the match. It's deja vu, isn't it? All over again, 2019, it was the scrum in the World Cup final that proved decisive. And here again, in 2023, in a semi-final, England within a heartbeat of reaching the big finale falls short again because the South African scrum just found its mojo and it's seen South Africa into a final against South Africa back in this stadium next Saturday night an eight o'clock kickoff and currently the England players out on the pitch their head the hip, hands on their hips utterly dejected they could not give any more Bobby just how decisive did that scrum prove it was everything wasn't it oh it was absolutely everything and you've got to say I mean with 10-15 minutes to go I felt that South Africa were buried there was a scrum on their line they won a penalty they clawed their way back literally out of the of the ravine onto the side of the bank started to get to their feet gently and in the middle of the field a scrum penalty and a close to 50 yard penalty by Andre Pollard a match winning penalty from a man who came on off the bench who's done this before unbelievable what? performance
Well, what does it say, Bobby, about the mindset of those men in those green jerseys? Because they looked gone. They looked out on their feet. England were in control. The game plan was working. And yet, and yet they found a way. It's, it's, what is that mindset all about? Well, I think that's what's the most important part here. You know, hats off to England. They played a beautiful game. The strategy was on point. The implementation was absolutely outstanding. But as part of, of, part of what we watch in this international game of rugby, winners find ways to win. And South Africa literally found a tiny little chink in the armor and exploited it to create a one-point victory. Absolutely outstanding. Sport can be so cruel, can't it? Because when Andre Pollard landed that monster kick around the 77 minute mark, that was the first time in the entire match that they were ahead on the scoreboard. And that's all that counted, ultimately. England are down there giving hugs to each other. Sarah Orchard, our reporter, is down there. She will get the reaction from both camps, but particularly from the England camp, who came so close to pulling off a quite remarkable upset. Matt Dawson, it's, it's so difficult, isn't it, when England was so unfancied and they came so close. How can you begin to sum up the opportunity that has just slipped away from them here? Uh, it, it, it's impossible to even begin to know how these these boys feel um, you know all, all sports people lose lose games you know, all sports people lose games that they should have won um, to do it in on the world stage to do it in you know the final knockings of a competition semi-finals uh, is it, 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 they'll be inconsolable for quite a long time um, that will it will really hurt for you know, they've, they've given absolutely everything they got so much right tonight putting South Africa away where they, I mean South Africa were looking left right up down inside and out they had no idea what they were doing until they just caught a tiny bit of of a flame of a spark in that scrummage and it just gave them some momentum and one passage of play from 22 to 22 drive over score and bang the game was was changed on its head um you, we haven't mentioned yet and i'm sure we will in detail L love him or loathe him erasmus and his coaches side are different gravy to make those calls in a world cup semi-final to get the hook out on Reinhardt, on Libok, on Willemsa, straight away, boom, off, Etzebeth, off, no messing. It's a lesson for everybody watching this quality of sport is, you know, the margins are too fine. You need to make the decision, you make them now. You do not go into the changing rooms and say, oh, if we'd done this or if we'd done that. It was a, it was a brilliant bit of coaching, but... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm waffling, sorry, as usual. Sorry, yeah, Sonia. It's all right. A few of the England players are finding their families in the crowd. Those hugs right now are lasting and lingering a little bit longer than they normally might. Jamie George has been talking to Steve Borthwick and he just they just looked at him, each other, and just Jamie George has just shook his head. He just didn't know what to say to Steve Borthwick. We'll be right back here to get more reaction to the fact that England are out of the World Cup, but gosh, by one point only, to South Africa, who will go through to the final. Let's get full time at Bramall Lane. Sheffield United, Manchester United, John Bennett. And it's finished with a 2-1 win for Manchester United on a poignant, emotional day for the club after the sad news that Sir Bobby Charlton has passed away. A victory for the club he served with such distinction. Diogo Dallo with a stunning second half winner outside the box, a shot which flew into the top corner. First half, Scott McTominay was hero and villain. He scored with a volley in the box. Then his handball gave away a penalty. Ollie McBurney scored it to equalise. Second half, it was even until that Dallow goal. Sheffield United won, Manchester United two. Courtney Laws with his kids just waving to the crowd. Owen Farrell is giving his thoughts. Gosh, penny for those. Uh, pitch side in his uh, post-match interview. 
talking about Laws, Farrell, Chris, you can add Itoje to that list, you can add Jamie George to that list. We talked about it before the game, that England, if they were going to get close, those sorts of players were going to need to bring out their top draw performances. Boy, did they in spades. Rolled back the years, didn't they? Those guys, um, I thought Itoje was at that form that made him one of the great second rows in the world. Lions Tour 17, World Cup in 19. Over the last few years, he probably lost a bit of ground to the likes of Eben Etzebeth, but he was magnificent today. Jamie George going 80 minutes and under pressure from that scrum. What an effort. And that's an area where England will rue over the last few years. They haven't quite built that depth at hooker, putting so much pressure on Jamie George. But what an unbelievable effort from the Saracen. And you mentioned Owen Farrell, a lot of pressure on him. He was made for a night like this, wasn't he? Given a tactical plan, he executed it nigh on perfectly. That drop goal was a captain's intervention. And that should, from an England point of view, they will feel be the moment we're talking about now, that drop goal that took England nine clear. And Courtney Laws, you also mentioned, I'd be very surprised if we see Courtney Laws in an England shirt again. The guy's 34. Steve Borthwick may use this Six Nations just to move the side on a bit in terms of age profile. I doubt he'll play on Friday night in the third place playoff. There's guys like Sam Underhill and Lewis Ludlam who'll be chomping at the bit to get a game. But what servants to English rugby. And they would love their final moment in England shirt to be lifting that World Cup. It's not to be, but they've made a lot of England fans and their families down here incredibly proud. There's lots of very emotional players and families on both sides. Sia Khaleesi's daughter was in tears. She wanted to get to her dad. She's eventually been reunited with him and there's a, a big hug for the Springbok captain. Paul Grayson, you're down there amongst it all. Just give us a sense of, the, of, of, of just what it's like to be down there in the aftermath of such a tense test match. It's extraordinary. So it is close to it. I mean, the England players and staff ashen-faced in the immediate aftermath because reality bites and it bites quick. They played a magnificent game of rugby, were totally in control. South Africa looking disorganised, disorientated, low on energy, couldn't find anything. And of course they scrape it, get ahead, and then suddenly South Africa have got all the energy in the world to defend brilliantly on the halfway line and eventually force the mistake once the whistle goes that's it there's no arguing with the referee there's no extra time on the clock it is all over Richard Wigglesworth a couple of minutes ago just walked behind me to get one of his kids out of the out of the crowd and the next 24 48 36 hours and beyond are just they're just pain for England because there were so few errors there were so few moments where they let South Africa into the game that It'll be hard to process how they ended up on the losing side and that they, whatever the plans are to go home, that, that clicks into process now. You'll be back in your house in a day or two. Um, Sean Edwards said it after France went out, sitting on your own, wondering how did we end up here? And there's not a lot you can point at to, that England were culpable of. They weren't, they weren't authors of their own downfall. South Africa found something when they needed it. Uh, it's a shame for these England guys, but as we said with Ireland, it's got to be a launch pad. It's not an end, it's a beginning. Doss, is that the performance that restores credibility, faith in English rugby? Uh, it's, cer it's certainly, uh, they're on a pathway. This World Cup, there's no question week to week, they have got better and better as the tournament has gone on. Uh, you know, the, the influence of the coaching staff has been apparent. They've, fight, they've found their feet, they've found their their mojo, they've found some momentum, and it, it's up to them. It, and listen, on a, who knows, on a, on a, on a very dry day, it, in very different conditions, who knows? But for the here and now, for what, what England needed, what the England fans and the players needed, this was absolutely prime. And England's performance was prime. So there's lots to build on. There's loads of youth coming through. It should be a fantastic launch pad going over the next uh, four years and we should all be incredibly enthused and positive for the team going on. Let's players hear from, came, oh, sorry, Tom. sorry, we just need to hear from the defeated captain, Chris. Uh, Sarah is with Owen Farrell. 
Yes, I'm with the England captain, Owen Farrell. Owen, I know you're going to be hugely disappointed right now, but you've just played a part in one of the most incredible Rugby World Cup semi-finals. Just talk us through your emotions. Um, I've just said a few times already, it's nothing, nothing too much about the game at the minute. Um, just about how unbelievably proud I am of this, this group, um, what they've done over the last five months together. Um, it's not all gone our way, as everybody knows. Um, it was kind of, kind of had everything thrown at us, and it's been a, it's been a proper roller coaster. And um, I'm glad we've built to, to where where we are now. We're unbelievably disappointed that we, we've uh, not got a crack at the big, at the big one next week. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm massively proud of this group, and I, I hope everybody uh, watching back home was as well. A lot of people at home were saying that that was going to be an easy result for South Africa. Your game plan was absolutely fantastic. Can you talk us through how the execution went? Um, yeah, well, we, came, we obviously came up with a plan during the week, but um, and the the weather conditions played played a part in it as well. And uh, I just I just thought we 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 started the game really well. I thought we we uh, shocked them a little bit at times. Um, they obviously made a few early changes to, to change what they were doing, um, but obviously credit credit has to go to them as well for for fighting their way back into it and like a class side that they are and and, and finding a way to win at the end. Before I let you go, this team has been on a huge journey. I know there's been a lot of talk that some of these players this will be their last World Cup. Mm. What can you say about how proud you are of being an Englishman right now? Yeah, um, massively. Yeah, um, it's. It's uh, ev everything. Everything that's gone with it. Um, the the how we've built as a group over the past five months, as I've already said. Uh, the support how it's built over the course of this World Cup. Um, and yeah, I, I think I think that that performance shows how proud we are to be English and how proud we are to wear that wear this shirt. And, and obviously, we've not come on the right side of the result, but um, I think I think we've made a we've made a start. Uh, of, of where we're going forward and there's, there's a lot to come from this group. Commiserations, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Understandably, in, um, terribly deflated Owen Farrell. Uh, uh, Chris, we hope to hear very shortly from, from the architect of that game plan, Steve Borthwick. I mean, how much was the... Yes, they came through this slightly easier side of the draw. That is the kind of... Not the elephant in the room, but that's just the reality, right? But how much will Borthwick be vindicated? Because he's always talked about in England a building. We're, we're, we're having to start again from scratch. How much is he going to be vindicated by that performance? Yeah, hugely, because I think we knew Steve Borthwick is the kind of coach who will have reveled in this. You know, we touched on it with Chappers earlier on Five Live Sport. He's not the guy who'll have a press conference in fits of laughter like Eddie Jones but he will have relished in the opportunity to tactically try and take down this Springbok machine. And with the weather as it was, and with England's strengths, being those experienced wingers, the kicking game, the way they hustled and harried and they thought on their feet and their, their, their work on the floor, their, their you know, intensity in defence, they so nearly executed it perfectly. And then they'll look at 15-6 and a scrum five metres out, and then again you look at what Borthwick got right. He, he put his two big scrummaging props on, the two veterans, and said, paint and picture and hold the scrum up. But then we know Kenj and Sinclair, for all their excellence around the field, aren't as technically proficient as those two. So England just couldn't keep up the intensity, whereas the box had Ox and Jay, who was man of the match there. I know he didn't win it, but he's turning games around with his scrum, and it's an enormous weapon. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's a massive achievement for, for England, given where they were, to, to get this close. We're talking about Steve Borthwick. Let's hear from him. He's with Sarah. Steve Borthwick, you're live on Five Live Smart. Huge commiserations to you. You were winning that game for 77 minutes. Can you talk us through your emotions right now? Um, I think, firstly, in any game like this, you have to take, you have to credit the opposition who found a way to win at the end. Um, South Africa are the current world champions and world number ones for for a reason. Um, now we thought we were going to win tonight. We came, came to the stadium tonight believing we were going to win the game and we came very close to it. And I think the players deserve enormous credit for that and I think all the, the tens of thousands of England supporters in the stadium tonight, the millions watching, listening back home, I think will be very proud of their team. It was one of the most incredible semi-final performances, one of the best matches that this World Cup has seen when it comes to this level. Can you talk us through your game plan, particularly around the wet weather conditions? Well, I think what we've got here is a, is a very smart group of players. They're, they're learning um, as we've gone on through. 
this period of time very quickly because we've had to do it very quickly. If you start looking at the opposition and, and the time they've had, and the four years had, we've had four months um, now. But that that's why the players deserve such enormous credit. I've asked them to do some things differently. I've asked them to approach the game a bit differently, um, approach the training, the preparation a bit differently, and the players have embraced that. Um, now, um, we'll look at the squad tonight. In that 23, we had seven players, 25 or under. That's the most of any of the semi-finalists. So we've got a great blend of experienced players and younger players. So for us, I think we'll, we'll, right now we're, we're disappointed and I'm immensely proud of, proud of these guys. We'll build and we'll be better going forward. Do you feel perhaps it was the scrum, particularly in the second half, that started to unravel for you? Well, certainly they, they, they got an advantage in that area and that's credit to them for finding a way to get that advantage. And before I let you go, Steve, a lot has happened in English rugby in the last year. What does it mean to you, the performance that your side have put in tonight? Well, I think, first and I've said this before, so please excuse me, is that I, I care an awful lot about these players. Um, so I'm really gutted for them and their families. Um, but I'm proud of them. The, the same thing, I, I really care deeply about English rugby and our supporters. Now, yes, there's been some tough times. Um, we've got work to do. Um, we all know that. But I think if you look, anybody looking right now would look at that group of players and see just how much they care about representing their country. We wanted to put a smile on some faces back home. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that tonight. Um, we'll aim to do that next Friday night. Commiserations. Thank you for your time, Steve. Thank you. That's Steve Borthwick. We'll talk to you finally in a minute, Bobby, about the, what now for South Africa. But just one final question on, on England, Dawes. Do they have to find a scrum if they want to compete with the big guns at the highest level? Because there was, a, there was very recently, there was an RFU talent ID programme in which they were literally just looking for front five forwards. Uh, I, I, I don't think so. Um... There, there was an opportunity for England to put that game well away. Um, we spoke about the opportunities to take. Um, I think England had opportunities. Might only have been two or three. That actually, whether South Africa had a brilliant scrum or not, they would not have got. You know, if they were 13, 14, 15 points ahead, then South Africa are not winning that game. Um, I think England have got a great set piece. I think they've got great talent technically maybe they could do something better um, but all in all that that forward pack challenge the best forward pack in the world at the moment and challenge them for a vast majority of the game so I, I think in, you know English rugby is not, not it, it's, it hasn't been uh, sorry ad administratively or the governance okay let's see the question marks but actually no one could doubt the, the individual quality of the players that are in that England squad. It's just about getting them together to play. And one of those who uh, very much stood head and shoulders almost literally above the rest this evening was the England fullback Freddie Stewart. He's ready to talk to Sarah. Yes, I'm with Freddie Stewart now. And Freddie, you've just walked off the pitch, you've come straight here. What was said by the players in just those final few moments as you just walked away from them? Um, yeah, a lot of raw emotions at the minute. Um, to go that close against such a such a great outfit um, and not get there in the end is, is is a tough one to take. Sports cruel sometimes, but you have to credit South Africa. You know they fought to the end and and, and made us pay for a few mistakes. But I was just so proud of the effort that that, that the boys gave tonight. Um, the coaching staff who who made us believe the team that put the plan together and. You know, we were so close, but we didn't get there in the end, unfortunately. I know this is a difficult question to ask you now, so close to the end of the final whistle, but um, do you think there were opportunities out there for you guys to do the job tonight? Yeah, I think we'll look back on that. And it, it, second half, if, we, if we'd have, you know, got a bit more set-piece dominance and a few less errors, we, we may have pipped them at the end. Um, but <laughs> hindsight's a wonderful thing. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the boys gave absolutely everything tonight and we just came up short. For you personally, obviously Marcus was starting in the 15 shirt, you've come back into it. How pleased with you, particularly with your performance under the high ball this evening? Yeah, only as pleased as you can be, you know, it's 
it, it, it's irrelevant really you know I'd, I'd rather play a, a terrible game and us, us win at the end um, but you know Steve made it very clear that from the very start of this campaign it's a, it's a squad of 33 and it's a 33 man effort um, everyone's been fantastic even the lads that weren't in the 23 tonight have given everything this week to help us um, it's been a real squad effort and, and it's unfortunate that it's, it's ended this way and I know there's a third, fourth game still to play, but this is the end of an era now for this England setup. What can you say about this team and what they've actually brought together in a very short amount of time? Yeah, I think, um, you know, on the back of a, of a pretty poor performance in, in the summer tests, you know, we had a, a lot of criticism and, and even tonight, you know, I think we were written off, but it just shows, you know, that group, when the pressure's on, we came together and we fought for every inch we fought all the way to the end um, and some guys will be moving on now um, some guys will be staying on and we've just got to keep building keep getting better use the things that, that went really well tonight commiserations thank you thank you thank you very much oh, a little waver in his voice that's the England fullback Freddie Stewart Bobby Skinstap former Springbok captain Daw said it a little bit earlier the, the South African coaching set up different gravy <laughs> there was a fabulous shot actually of Jacques Nienaber just the explosion of joy when he realized that he was going to be preparing for a World Cup final in, in a week's time uh, he looked like a man who actually didn't think that was going to happen how much did that final sort of 20 minutes of the match just have his imprint on it and Razi, Razi Erasmus's imprint on it big big time well you know we talk about the best laid plans and um I think their plan and their strategy has been on point. I think it, it felt like it almost unraveled in the first 60 minutes. And I was sitting next to Dawson. We were realizing that England had, <coughs> excuse me, England had unpicked them in all the right places. They'd unpicked them in, in the set pieces.